Welcome back to another week of USA Rugby Clubhouse. It's week eight, an eventful week. I am Ben Foden and I am one of your hosts. And as always, I am joined by Mr. Mike Petrie. Mike, how are you doing, buddy? Ah, Foden. Foden. <laughs> I can't believe I did that to you guys. I didn't, I, I, I'm sorry. Good mate. I told you it's it's, I'm it's sorry. I, it's the kiss of know. death. You gave it to you gave it to LA. <laughs> you, gave, you gave it to Houston and now you've just given it to LA. It's all good. It's all good. I was delighted. Secretly, I was delighted. I came off the screen and went, yes, Mikey's picked LA. We're definitely winning at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have a very good track record with picking those things right. That's for sure. Oh, but... mate, how can you pick any of the games? What a week of rugby. Literally <sighs> one score between every single game with one score in it. Two games, one in the red. In the last play of the game, both won. What a week of rugby. It's been just just some. I think, I think last week, I think last week I actually said that, you know, now we're start we're gonna start to see separation between the teams. We'll start to see a little bit of breathing room. Like some of the teams will really start to like go to the front of the table and other teams will take more of a back seat. But clearly <laughs> that was totally clearly we wrong. have no clue what we're and talking about. <laughs> No, oh, it's just like, it, but it, but it's it, these cross country these these cross country rivalries now, like these cross conference rivalries, I should say. You know, in cross country, when we talk about Toronto and Atlanta, but you know, you've got all these new names for these different rivalries, which is so cool. I think yours was what the Champagne Cup or something between L.A. and New York. Was that what it was? It was. Cool. I suppose it's massive. Like it's like five foot. But the, but the weird thing is, I think Mr. Gilchrist got so confident they didn't bother flying over the trophy. He got it made and left it in L.A. <laughs> So we're, we're waiting for the shipment of the trophy over. So, uh, yeah, we had a very smug guy, Bolton, come into our uh, our dressing room after the game going, oh, don't worry. It's it's, it's sitting in their coffee shop in there next to the basketball court. At the oh, no, I think, it was, I think it was next to the DJ it. booth. But it wasn't the basketball court. It was, it was the DJ <laughs> booth. Ah, uh, geez, that was that was. But what a game that was! I mean, I don't know if that's where you want to start, but like, but yeah, just, on, let's get it out of the way. Start with that. Get, get it out. Un, the way. Unbelievable. I mean, going into that game, you know, I, having done the commentary, we talked about the commentary that I've been doing at the games, and yeah. so I, I'm very fortunate to have that chance to do that in New York. And I have a great team that I work with with Alex Jimo and Matt McCarthy. And I remember talking to them beforehand. Just you know, and all three of us were like. I hope that New York can pull this off today. I really hope that they do. I I, I had a, a kid that I coach. He's a seven year old. He's in my daughter's class in second grade. Came out with his mom and his dad for the first time yesterday. He's ever first time he's ever seen live rugby. And I was talking to his dad today about it. And his dad was like, "Man, we've watched games on TV, but it's it's nothing like the real thing. Those hits were just unbelievable. I mean, the defensive display yesterday was like." There must have been some sore bodies walking around today, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's that's the thing. That's the one thing that we, have, from from learning le early lessons from Toronto and NOLA, is, you know, the, the giving away the ball easily and just the toughness in D. And sadly, um, Juan Le Guizamon came off pretty early. But speaking to the guys with him on the field, he propelled that. He propelled that intensity and brought that energy and we had him on the field for 15 minutes and he made a massive difference and hopefully you know he's going for a scan today but his knee's not too bad and we'll see him back on the field but the boys you know they said like just having him on the field for the time that he was on just changed the mindset changed the spacing changed the energy around defense and stuff and so yeah a lot of credit's got to go to Juan and what he's been doing but we've been working hard they, they to be fair we did you know a lot of strategy and tactical changes were made during the week of, of leading up to LA just to better us as a team as well not just to focus on LA just knowing that we needed to get better in certain areas and, and we implemented that I think pretty well I, and, and listen you have to take it for what it is as well LA have been at the top they're the Giants ready to be shot at so you know they, you can't win them all they've traveled you know a long way to come and play us and you know Gitter wasn't playing the fullback went down uh, Bryce very early um and so you know we're going to see a different side to them but you know it was a dry run hope people say a dry run of what could be a uh, an east coast west coast final so you know it, it's exciting it's good for us because we're gonna get the confidence that we can beat the best and we know and we always said that on our day if we play the right way we can beat anybody in this in this league and i'm sure a lot of teams say that i'm sure you know toronto say that because they showed it when they came to us they dismantled us 
you know, so it, it's very up and down. It's about being consistent. That's the only thing for Rooney now. We've got to be consistent, especially in this East Coast, because I think we're, you know, even though we beat LA, we're still six, six second in the league now, uh, as Nola won with a bonus point. So plenty to work on, plenty to keep getting. Hopefully it's confidence, though, that we can grow from. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, that, that LA team, though, I mean, they their defense was outstanding, too. I mean, they, they left you guys without scoring any tries. Yeah. Right? I mean... Yeah. That we talked a lot about the New York defense, but that LA team was was really doing a job on defense too. And that was yesterday. You talked about the finals, like that was like finals rugby. It was just like a like low scoring, very low risk, like lots of defense. And I feel like that could be like you said, a preview of what's to come when you actually get to the final game. With New York maybe sitting at the top of the Eastern table, yeah. LA sitting at the top of the Western table, and it's that kind of game, that that physical, you know, smash mouth brand of rugby. Mike, I have to ask you one thing because you were commentating in the commentary box. <clears throat> that penalty that LA took, <laughs> and it was at least a meter wide of the right post, and the touch judge put the flags up. What is going on there? That is a that is you could see. Uh, uh, luckily for the for the referees, our CEO was walking behind the post when it happened, and it missed. You could see Andy Ellis going, "What's going on here?" That's a bit of a. I think. From my perspective, you, you can't, it's really hard to tell from that angle with anything. And then on the replays, right? I mean, that it's the same sort of angle. It, it's, unless you're on the field standing there, you, it's really tough to make a call. And I, I obviously, I mean, I know Miles a while, the referee that, that made that call. And I mean, he's not going to do it intentionally. He's going to call what he saw. I mean, the, the post itself, the actual upright was not very tall, right? Like, as you know, it's not like, it's not like the ones that twicking them, yeah. that, you know? almost extend through the roof <laughs> so some of it's left to judgment and like i i all i know is i wouldn't have wanted to be in that spot yeah right? and luckily it didn't come down to that yeah luckily that wasn't like exactly, yeah. you know la won by one kick and it was because of that then that would have been a much bigger issue i think it would have it would have luckily uh what was funny that i did see what i did see though was the next kick that la made when it went straight through the uprights, there was no question about it. He put his flag up and he was smiling. He was like, here, he's happy. That, <laughs> no, was, that yeah. was an easy one. I know that one's gone that through. One, I, I got that one. Right. <laughs> I got that one right. I got, I got that one right. But, I, but look, I I don't know. I mean, it it's it must have been frustrating as a player, but look, there's nothing you could do about it. I mean, referees make, you know, make decisions all the time that like sometimes aren't right and you just got to get on with it. And, well, I thought that too. Um, to you know, like I said, you got to, I kind of respect the way that the guys got on with it. There was a few raised eyebrows and hands go up and maybe saying it missed, but the boys got on with it. It, it right. didn't let them, it didn't put them off the game. So all okay. correct. But you know, and, and I'm just having a dig and it's a funny talking point and it's always good to talk about points like that in rugby. But in all <laughs> essence, the, the judging and the officiating of games has stepped up a level this year. You know, we've seen people like JP Doyle join, join the league and we've mentioned the banter that they have with players and it's quite, you know, jovial and, and fun to watch. So you know, it's, it's the first time I've been like, mm, that's a bit sketchy. But I also, I think it sort of probably highlights the fact that we probably do need fourth official, um, you know, just to check things like that. And I think probably that will be implemented next year. But again, that's another monetary thing. You know, talk with George Kilbrew. I think, you know, you know, every game is an extra five grand to sort of like have have a fourth official there. So um, hopefully as the game grows, that sort of, those sort of things will be taken away and we won't have to sort of, I'm an R, whether it went over and there'd be someone who makes the proper decision in their little van's hidden away somewhere. So anyway, let's move on to the next game. Um, Nola versus Houston, um, a very close run affair, um, closer than we thought it would be. I thought that Nola would sort of run away with it. But Houston, again, show that, you know, they can still play some some rugby and, and they they could put up a good, good fight. Uh, only a two point victory for Nola, 28-26. Um, and but moves Nola to the top of the table in the East Conference. So it, it just shows that it's still wide open, this East Conference. Yeah, that, that East Conference is like a circus, and it's going to be down to, down to the wire at the very end. I mean, D.C. and Toronto, I think, are sitting at towards the bottom, but they could very easily – I mean, we see what Toronto is capable of, right? Like, yeah. they could very easily just leapfrog, leapfrog everybody at the very end, and, like, they're sitting in first place, and they're in the finals all of a sudden. But, um, I mean, look, Houston, Houston lately these past couple weeks has been playing some really good ball, and I think a lot of it has to do with the injection of Nick Boyer at scrum half. Yeah, definitely. And, He's, he's been a real presence for them. He really has. He's, he's done everything right to get them on the front foot. He's had some really, really good plays. He runs great support lines. 
Um, and you could tell that he's bringing a lot of energy that that side has needed when they were kind of in that lull uh, early on in the season. And so it's uh, it's good to see them to get into these competitive fights back and forth. But, you know, they're, they're battling. They are. They're they're staying in all these games. They're playing really well. They look really sharp. And I, I do think it has a lot to do with with Boyer being in there in the nine jersey. So credit to him for kind of bringing some injection of uh, of energy into that squad right now. This, you know, what quarter of the way through the season when they probably need it most yeah um yeah i i some you know weeks i'm impressed with with houston then some weeks i'm not it's just there but i think now i said like you like you said with nick boyer and their team it's made them more complete and they run a bit better they need to sharpen up their defense a little bit they still a team that leaks points uh, and you know when they do well is they score more tries than the other teams but they can show that they've got a good a good attack now and they're scoring tries and putting up a good score on the scoreboard it's just about you know plugging those holes and not leaking as many points, and then they'll start winning games again. So that's the big work on for them. And Nola have been impressive. Um, you know, again they've they've probably had a few slip ups along the way, but you know when they get things right and, and they gel, then they're they're a very good side as well. Uh, moving on to uh, New England versus Austin, uh, finished twenty two eighteen. The Gilgronies will be frustrated. Um, you, especially as LA slipped up for the first time, they could have probably you know, taken a bite out of that uh, out of that lead. But um, I was quite impressed with New England. I'm always quite impressed with New England. They just seem like one of those teams who are, can, can grind out wins. Do you know, like a team that when it's close, they always seem just to find a way to win. Um, and yeah, I think that they're, I think they're the other presence in the, the East Conference that are going to be pushing pushing hard. You know, we mentioned, you know, DC and Toronto sitting towards the bottom and we know what those teams, both teams are, are capable of, um, but sort of the three teams that are running that away with this East Conference now are sort of Rooney, um, Rooney, uh, New England and, and Nola are sort of pushing away a little bit, so it seems. Yeah, New England's a good side. And, and like we said, we knew that that was going to be a good game. We knew that Austin had a really good side. We knew that New England had a good side. And I think we both went with New England because they had the home field advantage. And I, I think it did pay off for them. I think, I think it really did. I, and, and if the tables were turned and they were playing down in Austin, we may have seen the exact same scoreline just flop the other way, right? With Austin walking away and squeaking out a little win yeah. uh, over New England. But you're right. They're, they're bringing some of that New England sort of style for that, that is characteristic of other New England sports teams, right? Yeah. That grit into their game that just, you know, they're starting to now become part of the uh, the fabric of the Free Jacks organization as well. And, you know, they'll be right there. They'll be right there at the end in the race to the finish for the East. Yeah, it seems like they're, they're sort of making a fortress of, of their home field. You know, you've got to really go there and play well if you're going to get anything out of the New England team. So, which is, I always think is very important for any organization, any successful sports organization. You make your home field sort of like, you know, somewhere that no one wants to come and play. I remember when I used to play for Sale Sharks, it used to be Edgley Park. And we always used to play on a Friday night in the, in the pissing rain in a sandpit. No one wanted to be there, but we loved it because we knew that we'd get a long weekend off the back of it as well. Uh, and so it, you make, make your place a fortress and, and you, you know, everyone looks at the fixture going, oh, bloody hell, we've got to go and play Free Jacks and on this date and this day. And that seems what, that seemed, to me, it seems what they're doing over there. I remember those conversations at Sale and I remember the conversations about going on the road and like, how difficult it was to play on the road. And sometimes I would sit back and go, you guys are going on like a three hour bus ride. You like, you know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not really going on the road. Like you're going up to Newcastle, like you're not going that far, right? It's like an away game, but really, I mean, come on. I mean, it's not like flying from New York to LA or New York to Seattle. That's, that's, a, that's an away game. That's going yeah. on the road. And there's a difference but, from uh, and there's a difference from getting in your private jet when you're playing for the Yankees or playing for the LA Lakers yeah, yeah, exactly. to, <laughs> to cattle class and jumping on the bus and Ubers and all sorts of stuff. Okay, um, the first game uh, we I mentioned in the in the in the build up, uh, two games one at the death. This being one of them, Toronto versus Atlanta. Although it's a home game for Toronto, it was played at the uh, the Snake Pit as they call it, but. Um, Great game, really, really good game to watch. Um, again, uh, our, our mate from last week who came on, Mark O'Keefe, shining, picking up a loose ball and going 50 meters and scoring it. Did you see after he scored the thing though? Look, look, he's going to cough up his 
spleen or something. He was not looking in good shape when he was copping back. And that's not the first time he's done that. He, it was a very weird thing, but all the all the uh, all his ex teammates from Rooney were all posting the video of him doing it on the way back. But um, but a great performance from from Atlanta and and another teammate of ours, Ross Deacon. Scored, um, scored in the in the death to win it for them as well, and game uh, winner, yeah, 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 yeah the game so, winner for Deacon, yeah, game winner. So yeah. you know, two old Rooney boys shining brightly for the Atlanta boys as they um, took a, a big scalp because Toronto are a good team. Uh, you know, we've got uh, Lucas Rumble on the show later on, who you know we can talk to. But I still think them not being at home, you know, living in hotels, you know, not being with friends and family, and sort of like. It must be a very weird experience for them living across the board. Yes. Not even, they're not even in their home country, for God's sake. It's just, you know, and I think that will be telling, you know, be telling on that team. So I hope I'll have a chat with them about it later on. Yeah, I hope so. Like you said, I mean, there, we mentioned early on that Toronto is such a great, great, great program, but living life on the road, I mean, even for a long weekend, this stuff, right? Like when you when you go out and have to live out of a hotel for four days, it's like, nah, you know, mm -hmm. like just a lot of things don't run as smoothly as you'd hope they would. And now all of a sudden you're talking about relocating an entire organization to, you know, an entire different country. Mm -hmm. And they haven't been home. They haven't seen a lot of their family. Like you said, that's got to be tough. That's got to be a tough place to be. And, uh, you know, credit to Atlanta. It was a close game, but Atlanta played well. They took it down to the, down to the finish and, it was good to see Roscoe get a try at the end there to uh, to seal the deal for him. And Mark O'Keefe has just got that X factor, right, doesn't he? He's just got the ability to kind of turn the game on a dime uh, from from some of his performances. And so yellow hair. you see those two really – what's that? It's the yellow hair. I think it's the yellow hair. It's the it? hair. Yeah. Although it didn't work for thinking about doing it myself now just because, you know, Troy's been playing well. We won against LA. How am I going to get back in the team? Just got diamond hair, yellow, and then Mark O'Keefe. Roll back the years. It didn't work this weekend for DTH, but throughout the season, that yeah, that that bleached yellowish like blonde hair thing has worked out really well for those two guys. So, folks, <laughs> that take notes. Take notes. Get it, get it in there. For sure. So but the other game, Toronto. Just, hold on one second. But yep. I just have to say this because I know I didn't get a chance to talk chat with Lu, uh, Lucas Rumble. Yeah. But like, I mean, how cool? Just genuinely, literally, like the your name is your name is last name is Rumble, and you lead the league. <laughs> in steals and tackles. So I don't know if you talked about that, but like, you know, for one <laughs> point and at one point in time, like he was like head and shoulders, top guy in stealing at the, at the ruck and top guy in, 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 in tackles. And it's like, you're living up to your name. Rumble. <laughs> if you, if rumble you, young if man, you. rumble. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, I was just so cool. Anyway, go ahead. Um, another game that was won in the last play of the game, um, Utah versus DC. We talked about DC stumbling. For me, I mean, they really did throw it away. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna concede at the end, and they were under the cosh, at least make them score on the edge and make the kick hard and make the kicker have to really like be on his game to kick the ball and kick the winning goal. But I don't know if you watched it, but they they it was a prop and a and I think the wing. And the wing pushed off and just slid off and, and it made it really, I mean, it, you know, Mika Cruz, fair place to him. He, he saw the hole and slid through it. But God, you've got to be kicking yourself if you're DC. You've really given it to them on a the plate. Yeah, I, that's the one game I didn't watch this weekend. I just saw the score line, And then you and I were chatting about it before, uh, before the show started. But, you know, I mean... I think you were saying that the, the stadium was packed out there. Yeah, the stadium was, yeah, right? the stadium was packed out. And it's, it was, it's probably brilliant for Utah rugby. And I think I think Utah now have jumped to second in the West Coast now and actually, you know, are, are doing well again. So maybe we need to get back on the Utah bandwagon because we were off it for a bit. We need to get back on it. Um, but yeah, it seems, seems like they got their stadiums are full. It seems like rugby's going really well down in Utah. And obviously they've got a team. They started winning. Um, all, the, all, the, all the sort of stars are aligning for the Utah team. And again, you know, we always we're always talking about LA, but Mika Cruz coming from LA, signing signing for them. We talked about Nick Boyd leaving LA and joining Houston. These two guys, I've I've, I've really shone in the teams that they've gone to. I don't know, you know, did LA not see the potential in them? I heard there was some rumors about salary cap and that sort of thing. But you know, fair play to these two guys. They have really gone in and shine. And Mika Cruz and you know, I just think that 
they've really been massive bonuses for both teams that they signed for. And Utah started really strongly, stumbled a little bit, and now they seem to be back on track and, and heading in the right direction. Yeah, that's I mean, look, that's great that both of those both those players have found new homes and really been able to make impacts where they're at because you know, if you're not able to, you know, as a professional player, right, you're in a system where you might, you're not, not getting enough time for whatever reason, whatever's going on, you're not playing whatever right. it is. And the next thing you know, someone else is willing to give you an opportunity. Yeah. And you jump across and it's great that they were both able to make positive statements. And like you said, the team that they left must be kicking themselves to be like, you know, maybe we should have held on to them. But that, but then again, maybe that wasn't the right environment for them, right? Like, oh, yeah, definitely. Sometimes I- it just takes. Yeah, it takes being in the right place. It does. And, and you know, right place, I always give that advice to players as well. Just because one coach doesn't like the style of your play and a closed door comes, don't give up because, you know, the next coach yeah. might be like the cut of your jib and then you go and play and you shine. And that's exactly what happened with those two guys. Obviously, they just didn't, you know, didn't fit the way that LA Guillotinis were, were, were looking to play or, or whatever it may be. There's two good guys ahead of Maddie Mashi Cooper at 13. Obviously, Harrison Goodard was carving up and scoring three tries in the first game, and, you know, that sort of thing. And, and you take your shots when they come and they had the opportunity to move and they both excelled. And, you know, delighted for both of those. And I think it's great for the game seeing guys who've moved from one club, you know, after a few games at the start of the season and they're doing really well for the clubs that they've joined. Um, last game <clears throat> it was a repeat of, uh, of the 2019 final, was it? Of uh, Seattle versus San Diego. Uh, two gate, two teams that have been struggling, um, and Seattle came out on top. I can't remember who we said might win. I think I did go with Seattle. I can't really remember. I think, so, uh, but it, you know, I, I think, think it's, I, I can't. I can't remember. I can't remember either. But that's yeah. we've given up on that. neither here nor there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Two teams that are sort of struggling, desperate, both desperate for points. And I think it, was it Seattle's first win of the season. Is that is that right? Oh, that might be true. I think it was Seattle's first in the season. I, I thought they'd won a game already, but I think it's San Diego that have won one previous to that. So both teams are struggling. Um, Seattle playing at home, obviously they they had a little bit more firepower, but you know San Diego, you just it's just weird. Like you say every time, it's just weird to see those two teams at the bottom. And I think I think they're done. I think as as far as their seasons, uh, you know, I've heard. I can't really announce, but I, I've heard on the grapevine that San Diego are bringing over a couple of big name players. We already know that Paddy Jacks is coming across, but a few of the big guys um, from New Zealand coming over to strengthen up the second row and the back row. Um, ho- hopefully Rob Shaw will be back. He's our guest later on as well. And hopefully he'll give us a bit more insight on what's going on. But, you know, it's been a mixed bag for them being in, a, in, in Vegas, moving back to San Diego, picking up injuries to Nate, picking up sh- injuries to Rob Shaw. Um, Again, but but Sahmushing was was outstanding again. He was a you know he's the only sort of bright light in another other words in another dismal dismal season for for San Diego. But he's been he's been very good week in week out. Yeah, he's an exciting player to watch. I mean, we talked about Lucas Rumble earlier leading the league in tackles and steals in the in the seven jersey in Toronto, but. Another player in the seven jersey that's really done some awesome stuff. Some, I mean, I feel like every time I watch a San Diego highlight, he's like one of the only players featured in the highlight reel because he's just, you know, but look, he's he's an athlete. I mean, he is just a really, really, really good athlete, and he clearly enjoys the game. He looks like he's having a lot of fun playing it. I remember playing against him, and he's just a he's just a grind kind of guy. He's a hard nosed guy, and. He's a good player. And so I'm happy to see him be so successful. And, and it's a shame that, and like you said, as a team, San Diego is struggling so much right now. And, you know, even if they do bring, bring some players in, is it going to be, is it really going to be too little too late? Right. Like, I mean, is the season kind of slipped away yeah. from them at this point, but I guess only time will tell and, and we shall see. And uh, with Seattle, I think that brightest find has been um, Ross Neal, who they've moved from 12 to the wing. And since they've done that, I think he scored, you know, four or five tries, scored two against us last week. I think he scored again this week, scored the weeks, weeks previous as well. So he's been a, a fine, he's a you know, sevens player. He's sort of come over from England. He was at London Irish, I think, where he's uh, sort of on the fringes of playing for them. But a uh, big guy, you know, one of these like modern day wingers where you know, he must be like six foot four and 112 kilos. Um, but he, he's quick, he sees opportunities and he takes them. And he's been a, a, 
a bright spark for, for Seattle. Yeah, well, look, we, we've been talking a lot about these games. It was an exciting weekend of rugby, only a couple points separating all of these different teams. So I think it's about time, folks, that we let everybody out there have a look at all of the action this past weekend. So here it is, your highlight package brought to you by the MLR from this past weekend. Enjoy. Oh, stolen away. Good work by Toronto. As Bills loose, you know, Keith scooping up. He thinks he sees an angle. And we're off to the races. O'Keefe with one man to beat. Extra lunge is not going to do it. Or is it? Oh, they're going to give it to him. J.P. Doyle keeps his close eye. Not this time. And there it is. Atlanta. Back on top, just in the nick of time. Ross Deacon, the substitute at the pylon, able to dot it down. And that's something that we're we're all about is hard work. So it's uh, yeah, I I can't I can't congratulate each one of these boys enough. Like, do you know what I mean? It's just 80 minutes of hard work. So. Ross, the inaugural fire and ice cup. Turnbull at the back. Callie waits. Slow ball here for Austin. They'll look for a quick reset. Callie has the ball. Mason, flat. Loop pass over the top. As Mooneyham to the corner. Connor Mooneyham, he's gone close. He likes it. It's hugs all round for Austin. Connected to the defense. Doesn't get any help, though. And normally, you'd see a shadow coming across in the form of either the blindside wing, which is number 14, but a little late. Gold jerseys versus the purple, green, and gold jerseys. Use it! Yeah, he's asking him to use it. Ball does come out. Play. Plenty of room here for the Sabercats. He's got a lot of room in front of him, looking for the fend. Gets support. That's Boyer, wide open. No one's in front of him. Scores the try. The first try of the day for his team. Yeah, I mean, just outnumbered him. Jojo Tikasuba kind of pinched in a little early, exposing the wing with space. Yeah, he's got 45 um, seconds. Uh, and Nick Boyer with a great inside support line. The press is on. Ball is out. Sabercats in the loose. Away. Sabercats threatening here now. They've got numbers. They've got numbers on the outside if they can get it there. Ball's drained in the middle. Yeah, this is going to be a try. Oh, look out for now. Here it is. In the corner. Velikana. Yeah, great build up. And he gets through here. Keeps his feet. Um, keeps his feet. I'm sorry. That's that's Boyce and um, the big Namibian. And that sets the whole thing up with the front football. One more hit up here. And then tons of space. They've sucked in the defense for New Orleans. Pretty easy over the top. Robbie Povey all alone. They come the same way again, this time with Tucci. Stay there, stay down, mate. Thank you. Hurst, Schulte, goes back to his left. Crusade turns him inside out. Mika Crusade! He has given them a chance to win this game. They are down by one, kick to come. All eyes now shift to Hagen Schulte. That we've seen the fracture in the defense. Roberts Tanana comes out, shoots out of the line, creates the space there. Some advice yeah, against your former set. team. Here's Stephen Lindsay throwing it in. He looks like a swashbuckler off a pirate ship, the hooker. LA swinging back to the short side now. There he is again with the ball. He's got a little open room. And here comes Cardi. Cardi right into the hands of LA. There's another try. Close there. Or our first try, I yeah. should say. Running options everywhere. So take a look. Here's the line out. They just kind of set this up with a forward pod right off a short line out. They swing back down the short side. You can see the nine loop. That's just a decoy. Inside pass. Inside pass again. DTH. I mean, just he is just a world class win. Try 
Trying to break through, able to find some space. Cam Clark, the captain. Excuse me, Basson rather there, and across Basson, the former Springbok breaking through from Cam Clark, and then just I'm coming fine, back on you. the inside, knew he had Basson on the outside, and in the tackle that offload. That's a not not an easy thing to do either, and that's an automatic seven points. Hi, I'm Lucas Rumble with the Toronto Arrows, and you're watching the USA Rugby Clubhouse. Okay, our first guest on the USA Rugby Club house is none other than the rock himself from Toronto across the border. A Canadian at heart with 35 caps already at the young age of uh, 25. Uh, 2019 World Cup attendee. It's none other than Lucas Rumble from Toronto Arrows. Lucas, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Cool. Uh, mate, I've got loads to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to kick off with a real... Real easy one, you probably get asked it all the time. Obviously with COVID happening and it's meant that Toronto have had to sort of move their whole um, whole association over across the across the border. And now you're set up, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're set up in Atlanta. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, so we're set up uh, at a hotel here in Atlanta. Um, so like a home away from home. It's, it's honestly like a, just a really long tour to be fair. <laughs> really okay so you so that's is that just just you guys as a team you're in a hotel is that where you're going to stay until until hopefully COVID laws lift or is it going to be something that you know you're going to look to get in airbnb houses can wives and girlfriends come over have you got your own real bubble i mean so a, few, a few of the boys have uh, got out of the hotel you know it's just hard here with housing uh, and being foreigners and being here for you know a, a short period of time uh, people are skeptical to rent or it's it's just difficult to find houses and accommodation for enough of the boys here. So a few guys have, have gone out who have had, who have families already and are living in homes, but uh, I'd say the majority of the team is still in the hotel and, you know, we'll likely be here um, if the border opens up and we can get back to, to Canada. And so how do you think that's sort of, obviously that's going to have a massive effect on, on you guys as a team. Um, Cause you're used to, you know, it's always nice to sleep in your own beds, wake up with your training ground and you've 10, 15 minutes away and, you know, always, you, you sort of get those home comforts and I always thought it's a very strange game rugby as well because home field advantage does play a massive part in rugby and I could never put my finger on it because you know nothing changes the same ball same pitch same 15 guys against 15 but there is something about playing at home and obviously that's a massive negative for you boys how have you found how have you found that in terms of like playing home games I know that you've had to travel away you, you played one home game in in NOLA which was which is very surprising for me because Obviously, that's a long trip for you guys from from Atlanta to Nola, and it didn't really pay in your favor. No, it's uh, you, you know you honestly don't realize what a home game means until you have to do a home game away from home. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you miss yeah you miss the small things right like the ability to to just get away from it to you know see your wife girlfriend see see the family go go out take the dog for a walk things like that you just don't get that here. You always kind of are stuck in that rugby mode. Uh, especially when you know you're living in the same place as your coaches and your staff and you know you run into everyone in an elevator all the time so it's it's honestly those small things that uh, that have, that have been affecting us and you know we don't want to use it as an excuse or anything like that and I think we've been here long enough now where we can't use it as an excuse anymore you know it, it we have to suck it up we have to be better and you know make it the best we can possibly do and I think coming into you know the later half of the season we're definitely uh, more suited to do so. We have a, a lot more home games, so we can get used to not traveling every weekend and not having to bounce around, you know, hotel to hotel. At least we can make this hotel, you know, like our, our home away from home. Yeah, definitely. And and you've, your Toronto are the same sort of same bill as, 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 as Rooney. You know, some games you're awesome. Some games you're a bit lackluster. Uh, what do you think that's down to? Um, you know, I just spoke to you before we went on air and I said one of the things that we tightened up at the weekend was was our defence and what we were doing. And and that solely came down to when you guys came over here and, and really ripped us apart, uh, especially in the backs. You know, you, you I mean, you're one thing that you've been brilliant at yourself is, is getting on the ball as well. And, and we highlighted all these areas of, of where we were going to sort of like we were expecting you to come. And, you know, you were hi highlighted one and you still had a field day at turning over the ball. We said the back three were dangerous with ball in hand, and yet they still scored, you know, five tries between them. Um, so they're the areas that we fixed up, and and you, you, 
you know, you can always get better, but um, we, we feel that after playing you and losing that game, it's sort of strengthened us, give us the wake-up call that we needed. And obviously, we had a very good victory at the weekend. Are you still figuring things out as a team? Or is there anything you can put your finger on saying, oh, this is why we don't perform well or from week to week? Uh, I, if I had the answer, I think we'd be uh, in a lot better of a position, to be honest. You know, it's, it's something I think the whole league has struggled with this year is finding that consistency in play. And with a year off, you know, with COVID and everything, and a lot of the guys in this league not really playing a ton of rugby, I think that leads into it. It's tough to find yourself back into form, tough mm -hmm. to find yourself, you know, doing all the right things for 80 minutes, week in, week out. You, you do have those mental laps and, you know, it's, just something you weren't used to and that, that break I think is has had a longer effect on us than I thought and I think that in combination with having to you know pick up your life and move down has affected the boys it's, it's mental errors like we, we know we need to do the right things we know you know you got to get your body light body height low here or hit this left or do that it's just you're shutting off mentally and sometimes you know things away from rugby can really play a big effect on that. Okay, I'm going to take, take off enough of them, Milal. So I'll, I'll take you back to your childhood because I'm very interested to know how rugby is in Canada. So how did, what did, where did your rugby journey begin? How old were you when you first got into the game? And, and, and... I was uh, 12 years old, man. So I uh, honestly didn't know what rugby was when I first started playing it. Um, I basically played hockey, soccer, lacrosse, a bunch of different sports growing up. And I was looking for something to do in the summer. And my brothers had started playing in high school. Um, with a, with a local rugby coach, Paul Duras, and they saw I had nothing to do, and they were basically like, hey, come out to the club. They have a team your age, and, and you know, start it, enjoy it, something we like doing, and they were right. You know, I, I met uh, that summer a bunch of buddies who are still big friends with today, went to university with one of them, and it, it really kind of started out of nowhere. It wasn't something I was aware of until, you know, you, you find someone in the sport, and I think that's how it is in Canada is it's yeah. it's – not really out there and in your face, you know, the, the hockey, the soccer, all those other big, big name sports and sports with big, le big leagues are in your face and, and rugby yeah. one of them. Do you think that it is, is, it's growing in Canada like it is in America? Are we likely to see a, well, I'd like to see, hopefully we'd see another, another Canadian team join the league, maybe someone like Vancouver. I know there's a lot of rugby played around that area. Yeah, it's, de it's definitely growing. Um, you see kids, you know, younger than I, younger than I was, excited to be playing and you see kids in these academy programs and all these different opportunities from the ages of you know 12 to 20 that weren't available to me at all that high performance level is really starting to come down to to the younger kids and that'll just help it grow and grow out there you know when there's something to it to achieve on a professional level i think that helps grow the sport even further um because you know, as a kid, you, you want to have your name up there. You want to yeah. be playing those big games in front of those huge, huge crowds. And it's, it's tough to interest a whole group of kids when that's not there. But now that there's one team in Toronto and, and hopefully another team in Canada, that kids can look up to that and aspire to be there. And talking of Canada then, so how is uh, the international uh, scene as well in Canada? Because I, I mentioned that you've already amassed 35 caps at a young old age of 25, which is pretty impressive. And you've been to a World Cup in 2019. Uh, how is how is can Canada rugby looking as a whole? We're looking we're looking a lot better, you know, especially with the MLR. When I was starting to get caps um, back when I was, you know, 19, 20, I would go from playing university rugby one week, like into a test match against Ireland the next. So <laughs> it's like these crazy disparities <laughs> in levels. And, you know, it, it doesn't prepare you as well as you want to be. Uh, you know, the uni rugby was good, but it was nothing like the international stage. So having something like the MLR to, you know, allow you to play year round, allow you to develop your craft further, is just going to help improve our rugby at the national level so much. And with, uh, you know, COVID, it's been tough because we haven't been able to get a game. I think the last game we'll have had will be at, would have been at the World Cup. Yeah. Even then we, we ran into a, a typhoon, which canceled our last game. So we've had a <laughs> little bit of a bad string of luck. Hopefully in the summer here, they just confirm those tests. Hopefully they can, you know, we get them played and, you know, we get back on the right foot. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that as well, because interestingly, England have just announced they're going to play two games, one against the US and then followed by Canada at Twickenham. In the, starting, in the starting weeks of July, I was wondering what's been said to you guys, because obviously Toronto, you, you guys are the only Canadian team in the league. 
and I'm guessing at least half your team is probably made up of Canadians who are probably some of them and most of them would be involved in the, the national side. What's going to happen for those two weeks when, you know, you guys are, are flying off to England and playing an international because obviously there's a little bit of conflict of interest and, and, and how's that going to be dealt with? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure. You know, that's a, that's a question I think above my pay grade. I, I, I think <laughs> be, uh, making selections, you know, based off who's in form and uh, I'm pretty sure that is a, a window, a test window. So I think guys will, you know, it's yeah. not it's not like those are small games either. Those are no. those big big teams that you might <laughs> never get the chance to play against again. So you might you might have to go and you know, I think the Arrows and Rugby Canada work really well together as well, so there will be some definitely give and take there and and I'm sure they'll find a solution that's amicable to both parties. Yeah, I I'm really interested to see what happens just because as it's how tight the East Conference League is as well because we play you you know, I was checking and I was hoping we played you that week. But we don't we play the week before, um, and I think I think America play the week before Canada do. So actually, we'll lose a few players to the American side, so we'll be weakened, and they could be really big crunch matches. Yeah. And that's just very interesting because I know that the um, American rugby now work with the MLR, which is great because that's where I think it's always important that your governing body is involved with your professional league. So they're obviously in talks, and they're probably you know talking about it and coming up with a. A solution, but it's it's been very interesting to see that go on and just be announced. And obviously, internationals like you are in the in the frame, um, and probably will go out and play those fixtures. It's just uh, it would be very interesting to see what happens to the season. I'm curious myself. <laughs> okay, um, what are your ambitions in rugby? Obviously, you're only 25. You've been to a World Cup already. Obviously, you're going to want to continue your international journey. Are you? you know, fully set on trying to grow rugby in Canada, grow rugby in America with the MLR, or are you, have you got sites to maybe go over to Europe or the Southern Hemisphere if the opportunity comes? Uh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely keen to help grow the sport here. Um, first, you know, it's something that, again, it's an opportunity I didn't have when I was growing up and something I didn't think that was going to be an opportunity. And now that it's here and, you know, how North America does sports, it's always, you know, big and bad and developed and, you know, really loud. So hopefully that can pick up with the rugby here and that'll increase the national stage for both the US and Canada. But I, but I would uh, I would also say I'm young enough where I could go wherever, you know, the opportunities take me. And I think that's the best thing about rugby you yourself and know, you know, if an opportunity, a door opens up in a foreign country and somewhere you've never been an experience that you want to have, you, you definitely take it and you, you go with it and you run with it because you're lucky to have it and you only have it for so long, right? Yeah, it's, well, it's interesting because obviously I was, the opposite way around. I sort of played rugby all the way in Europe, came towards the end of my career and had an opportunity to go then, which sort of made sense to me because, you know, international was finished. And I sort of wanted a fresh start and something new. And, and like you said, I, I'm very interested in rugby in America. I think it could be a really big powerhouse and it could, could actually even change the face of rugby for all, all the clubs because of all the, the way Americans treat sport. Um, but for you, obviously, it's, it's a bit different because you're in the league now. You know, you're very young, but in terms of your career, you're quite seasoned in terms of having 35 caps for your, for your country. You've been involved with Toronto Arrows now. Is this your second season involved with the team? I think it is. You were uh, after COVID. It was technically third. Yeah. But, yeah. All right. Okay. So <laughs> technically third. Um, so it, it's just obviously because for me, obviously, and, and on other people, I always preach that it's a business at the end of the day. And, and yeah, we're very lucky and privileged that we can play rugby for a living. At the end of the day, if you get an opportunity and someone wants to pay you like a large amount of money to go and play in France or go and play in, you know, you should never feel the guilt to that, you know, clubs put on you say, oh, you are was, you know, you should be here growing the game of rugby. And sometimes you take that on your, on your shoulders. But when you get older in life, you realize that, you know, your window to sort of make the most out of rugby is very short. And so, you know, watching you is going to be, because I think you're, you know, you're one of your standout players for Toronto. You, you are a, an out and out seven, someone who's constantly a, a, a gnaws across the field, turning over ball, just being a nuisance that people have got to isolate. So I can see teams looking at you and thinking, this guy's good. Maybe we should get him over. Um, so, you know, would I think it's, uh, would you be interested in going over and, and, and sort of like, obviously not chasing the money, but, you know, seeing the opportunity to go and build not your craft that, overseas? I definitely, I definitely would. It's not, uh, it's not something I would turn down. Um, it'd have to be the right fit, obviously, and it would have to make sense. But again, it's another experience that I would never have if I, if I didn't play rugby. Um, who knows what I'd be doing, you know, and I likely wouldn't be moving country to country if, the, if that's 
what I do, yeah. and the sport I love. So uh, I wouldn't say no to pretty much anything. I'm, I'm pretty open when it comes to those things. And in terms, you mentioned, you know, you're very keen to sort of help grow rugby in America and in Canada. What do you think the extent that rugby can achieve over here in America? We can see, I, you know, I've been involved since the Rooney became professional, which is, the, I think, the same year that Toronto joined the league as well, which is yeah. three years ago. And every year it's got better and better, not only just for us as a as an organization, but just as the standard of play, you know, the refereeing and that sort of stuff is just getting better every time, every year. Uh, and, and eventually, you know, the crowds are building and that'll come back obviously when COVID sort of packs in, but you can see Utah now are getting a good crowd and, and Austin are doing big things and things like that. And obviously you guys used to have a good crowd when, when you were back at Toronto. So when the crowd numbers come in, do you think that, you know, rugby, this, this league can be something that can compete against will be a conveyor belt first and foremost to produce internationally talented players like yourself playing for Canada and, and America that can then go to World Cups and compete, but also just a league that competes with Super Rugby, with the Premiership, with the you know, uh, Magnus Super 14, all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I, de I definitely think it will. Um, if it continues to grow and, you know, their talent keeps coming in from outside of the country and then talent keeps coming in from within the countries. I think it's finding that balance is key and, and not overextending yourself too much by just bringing in a ton of guys who, you know, who are older, who want that experience, but in a few years will be gone, right? You don't, you don't basically, basically me. Well, <laughs> sort of. Extent, but in big, eh? you got, you're doing stuff like this, you know, you're, you're big into the team and you're helping grow the sport yeah. as well. You're not just here just to be here and just to have that experience you do want to see it furthered and i think that key of not overreaching and just taking it slow you look at like an mls or something like that who did a very similar thing mm -hmm. and just slowly built up and eventually you will get to that competitive stage where you're competing with those bigger markets or you know what used to be bigger markets to where you know north america is huge when it comes to sport when they buy in they buy in big yeah so if we can ever get to that level it will be an uncapped potential, I think. And do you think that, you know, being in America and American sports in general, it's all about entertainment, big spectacle. And we're seeing that with a few guys, you know, Austin are doing it, LA are doing it, you know, even going to NOLA, they were doing things, you know, with mascots in the crowd and that sort of stuff, firing t-shirts into the crowd. Do you think that's going to be part of rugby? And because obviously, I don't know how it is in Canada, but back in England, rugby is very prim and proper. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they always said it's a, you know, a, a thug sport played by gentlemen, um, but it's all very rah-rah. It's all run by, you know, the RFU who are a bunch of old guys who sit around a table. Whereas American, American sports is run like a business, you know, and they want to get crowds in at stadiums and they don't want it to just be rugby nuts coming to watch games. They want to make families come. They want stuff for children. And that's why they do cheerleaders, mascots, you know, halftime shows and stuff like that. Do you think we're going to see more and more in that as, 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 as the game grows? I think so. I think uh, within North America, it's just the way they do sports here. You know, there's tailgating, there's, you know, promotion night, bobblehead night, all that, all that crazy stuff that you don't see elsewhere. And I think that's the only way the game will grow here because that's what fans here like. And that's how they engage is through those, you know, more flamboyant, more loud things. So I, the game to me will always keep its integrity. Those things never really change what happens on the field. Yeah. Exactly. I but agree completely with that. You get more people in and you get more, once you get them in, right, you'll fall in love with the sport. Once you, you know, learn the intricacies of the sport, you really enjoy how it's played and enjoy watching it. But I think what people struggle with is getting people in the door. Yeah. And the North American player doing things is a good way to do that. Definitely, definitely. I want to know, I'll, I'll let you go in a minute, Lucas, but I want to know who your um, idols were in terms of like when you were growing up in rugby, who did you, you know, watch on the TV? Who did you aspire to be like? She said you started playing when you were you know, 12. So at the age, I'm guessing like 40 or 50, when you were watching international rugby and that sort of stuff. Yeah, obviously, you know, Richie McCaw is a big one. Um, you know, guys like that, like uh, Hooper is another big one. I, I kind of been watching through my career and it's a, it's a tough, well, it's not a tough position to watch, but it's, uh, you know, I appreciate what these guys do. They're, it's, they're tough and they work hard and, that's kind of what I value my game and, and how I train after. And hopefully that bleeds through. So yeah, it would be McCaw and, and Hooper would be two, two of the big guys. The reason I ask you is that uh, an old teammate of mine, you've sort of, you're sort of going for his look. He's called Sebastian Chabal. He played <laughs> for, uh, for France. 
And you've definitely got that look going on at the moment. Yeah, the look is, uh, it was for the World Cup, to be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just never got it. And I, I, the days are numbered on the look for sure. There's uh, no there's, way, no way, dude. You got to keep it going. You got to keep I know, it going. But uh, I won't have a girlfriend much longer if I keep it going. <laughs> yeah, that's always what it always just the pull. Bared so. too long at this point. So I'll tell you a story about Chabelle, though, because he grew the big beard, um, yeah. grew the big beard, had the long hair, and he was notoriously known uh, for driving around sales. So it's a Manchester sales shots uh, in a in a smart car. And smart car heard about this and then next thing he's doing a you know doing an advert for smart car because a gigantic bloke getting in his car and looking like a you know a prehistoric man so that was one so suddenly he, he's getting free smart cars and getting paid to drive those and then the other one because he grew his beard so long and he had an absolute stormer in one of the games and became a bit of an icon in france i think it was like bic razor offered offered him like half a million pounds to shave off his beard using a using a bit bit razor so mate i think you should hold off for another world cup hold off for another world cup grow the big beard who knows the big money contracts could be coming your way you'll be the poster boy <laughs> oh, i love that <laughs> right thanks for coming on the show lucas uh, i wish you all the luck in your season um i you know i do feel for you guys being away from your home um but you, you're doing a great job obviously you've thumped us when you came to to cockray stadium so uh I'm, you know, I've got no smugness in me at all, so <laughs> I've got nothing to say. But you guys, honestly, I think that, you know, you're a very, you know, complete side when you get things right and uh, you're very dangerous and, and you really did take us apart. So you gave us a lot to think about. So I should probably be thanking you. You gave us the wake up call we needed early on. So, um, but thank you for coming on the show. It's uh, great to speak to you and continue the good work in the MLR. Bro. Thanks for having me. Good luck with the rest of your season. All right. Cheers, Lucas. Hi, I'm Chris Robshaw of the San Diego Legion and you're watching USA Clubhouse. Our second guest of uh, this week's USA Rugby Clubhouse uh, needs no introduction. He is the former skipper, my captain of England, and also a 300 appearance, appearances for Harlequins back in the Premiership, a one club man, a legend of the game, and now a, uh, well, a quick, he's had one appearance with the San Diego Legion after picking up an injury, but it's a good mate of mine, Chris Robshaw. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Foge. Yes, it's, uh, it's good to see you. Um, you too, buddy. It's brilliant to be here, mate. I've, I've enjoyed it. Like you said there, I've, I've not played as much as I would have liked, <laughs> uh, but hopefully I can make up for that soon. Well, yeah, that's where I'm going to start. I'm just going to say, how, how has life been since you know, deciding to up and move sticks across the pond, thinking you're going to be in San Diego. Suddenly there's a problem with that. You're off to Vegas. You're in Vegas for a month or so. Then suddenly, you know, you find out you're pregnant or I think you already knew you were pregnant, but obviously you're pregnant with your, your beautiful wife, Camilla. And, you know, if suddenly you're there for a month and then suddenly you're back to San Diego, how is, like, forget about the rugby, how is, you, you know, your life in general over this side on the West Coast? <laughs> I mean, even kind of saying it like that, it sounds stressful. Um, it, it was. Um, for us, coming from the UK, where we have the NHS and all that kind of stuff, and like you said, my, my wife's pregnant, so kind of that's kind of taken care of you. You have an amazing service back there. When you come over to the States, and it's all, each state is differently, differently run and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you're going to a place you've never been before, um, trying to work out how it all works, all this kind of stuff. It was, it was complex, it was stressful. Um, but we got there in the end and we're kind of, we've settled now. Vegas was, we tried to make the most of it, whether that be myself and Camilla, the, the whole team, uh, the owners, the club, whatever, but for, for some reason it didn't quite work for us. But yeah, we're back in San Diego and it's, it's brilliant here. I mean, it's, yeah. you, I'm sure you've been to play down here and what a place to play. We live kind of five minutes from the beach. I know we've, we've not had the season we would have hoped for, especially after last year, um, but yeah, hopefully we can get things back on track. So, so I've, I, used to, I used to go on holiday on the West Coast all the time. And definitely my top three weekends of carnage, San Diego. <laughs> loved it. Loved, loved it. Loved the place. Loved the fact that there's like a beachy vibe and then, you know, five, ten minutes drive and you're into a big city. It's a, it's a very unique city and, uh, you know, I love it. I'm glad that, I'm sort of glad that you moved back because I know that you had those talks early on about you know, going to San Diego, and that would have been one of the reasons you went there, just because, you know, you the feel of it, the lifestyle there, the West Coast. 
And then when I heard, you know, you were up and going to Vegas, I love the Vegas as well. You know, don't take it away from Vegas. I love the Vegas, but I could never read, you know, Vegas, you want to go for three or four days and then you want out. And so to be there for months at a time, it was, I was like, oh, I felt for you really. I did really feel for you. But, you know, watching on Instagram, you know, you're making the most of it. You were going to the tours, seeing the sites, catching shows. How's Camilla found it all as well? Heading over to the States. Yeah, again, pretty similar. And, and you'll know, speaking to people back home in the UK, that, that things are very different there. We've kind of locked down and all that kind of stuff. And mm. and when we got to Vegas, it was, it was kind of like, everything was pretty normal. We were allowed to eat outside and because it's nice weather, you don't mind eating outside. You go with your friends and then after about two or three weeks of being there, you're allowed to eat indoors again. And it felt very normal. And again, yeah, there's some great kind of treks and all that kind of stuff. So we tried to make the most of it, but but like you said, you should probably only go to Vegas for three days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, we, we went to Vegas and I think as a, an organization, we were promised stuff from the city of Las Vegas that we could have these facilities and well you know the pitch we played on wasn't yeah. up to what we were expecting to be on um the posts were wonky and all this kind of stuff and just for whatever reason it didn't quite take off and wasn't quite the success we would have hoped for so yeah moving back to san diego which was stressful in itself they say one of the most stressful things you can do is move house yeah Hello, it, 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 countries and states and all that so um, yeah, the second, the, yeah, there's the, the top three is like uh, a death, a wedding, uh, oh no, a death, also a, a baby, and moving house. But it's the <laughs> most stressful things in the world. So you're doing two of them. You're getting two of them all in, in one, and then obviously moving states and moving countries. I, I, you know, I was feeling for you, mate, but, um, but I'm we, glad you're back in San make, Diego. Yeah, we tried to make the most of it, though. Like everyone, from owners to players to partners, all that kind of stuff, everyone got, got involved. Uh, all the partners were in the gym, kind of painting the gym to try and make it as nice as possible. And um, there was a great feel to it like that. And we all knew it was a, a strange situation and one which wasn't people's first choice, especially even friends and family. And a lot of people actually left their partners and wives back in San Diego with my, all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, being back in San Diego where you can train hard and then go do your recovery on the beach. Yeah. And that was one of the big things about coming over this way. They were... You know what it's like in England in January where it's raining and cold and then you're in a wheelie being ice bath and all that and here you're just down to the beach and it's definitely a different escape mentally and it's very fresh for me. Awesome. Right. Let, well, let's talk about rugby anyway. Uh, I'm going to go back to your career back in England. Obviously, um, a Harlequins man through and through, through their academy system, into their first team. Uh, quite special. I, I did a similar thing when I left Northampton. I had played 250 games and was done and you did 300 done which is quite you know it's quite a cool thing quite a, like a you know a cool number just to sort of round off on it's a, a massive achievement there's not many players you know you probably can name them on a on one team sheet on how many players have, have played 300 times for one club so congratulations on that milestone but how was it you know leaving somewhere that would you know you were sort of part of the furniture and that decision to leave Quinns, uh, and you probably had offers from you know, France, other clubs in England, but you decided to come and give the American League a try. How did that all come about? Yeah, so so firstly, it was kind of early on in the season. I kind of I was on around the two eight five mark. Mm -hmm. thought, oh, you know what? It'd be cool to get to three hundred games, and and then I had a couple of injuries and things went kind of against me and I got rested for a game too many, which I didn't want to because in my head I was kind of counting a couple of games. And then, yeah, luckily I played my second last game, which was my last home game, which was very emotional. Yeah. Um, and in my head after the game, I was like, I got through it. I, I can make it. I can play one more game and I can get to that 300 game. <laughs> and, um, but it was, it was sad in a way from a, a personal point of view to, to run out to an empty stadium. It was so emotional and the club did everything they could and they allowed my family and a couple of friends to come, which was brilliant. But you were kind of running out and I was, I was even a bit teary. <laughs> there was just no one there. And it was, um, yeah, a little strange. But but yeah, early on in the season, um, look, we're, we're getting a little bit older in our careers, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And for me, I just felt like mentally, and, and I always say when you play, just mentally, you know. You know yeah. when it's time to move on or to call it a day. And, and for me, I, I wasn't quite ready to stop playing. I still yeah. felt I could get more out of myself and add, add value to a different team. And I've spoken to so many of my friends about living abroad, um, yeah. whether that be in a rugby capacity or a, a normal job kind of thing. 
and they've all loved it. Maybe not forever, but they've just gone two, three years in and absolutely loved it. And they say it's some of the best time in their lives. And another one for me is I'm extremely dyslexic. So I'm very dyslexic. So I thought for me to go to somewhere like France, Japan, in a foreign language, I would struggle to speak, pick up the language. So I think you go out for coffees or you go for a beer with some of the guys and you can only pick up every third or fourth word. And then all of a sudden, oh, you miss it home and stuff. Where So this is why kind of America really kind of opened the door. And I've lived in London my whole life. To come live on a beach or five minutes from the beach is, is incredible. And it's a league which is, which is making ripples around the world. It is starting to make a bit of noise. And there are more players. You've been here from day one. Um, and there are more players coming in. And I'm sure you get calls all the time. I get messages and stuff about what's it like, what's happening. Um, and it is growing. It's, it's definitely not the finished product yet. Yeah. But there definitely is room for this American League in a, in a rugby calendar. Um, and I definitely think there are. And what I like a lot about it is it has some rugby values, but it's not stuck in rugby traditions. Like it has its American spin on it. Yeah. And that's what I enjoy, whether it's the commentators or the, the crowds and the fan zones and all that kind of stuff. They put their spin on. And I think as rugby around the world or sports around the world, we can learn a lot from American sport because they do some pretty yeah. amazing things. Yeah, they might be over the top on some of it, but they give it a go. Um, and yeah, I've really enjoyed that side of it as well. Well, you've probably seen, obviously, you had a stint with, with England where you were captain and obviously you've probably seen a bit more of behind the scenes of what like the RFU, how they want their players to conform. They never want anyone in the papers for any of the wrong reasons. They don't want arrogance. They sort of want that out. And you mentioned, you know, the American tag on sports. And if you look at all the sports that are so big here, the likes of the NFL, the, the basketball, the baseball, the, the hockey, you know, they love the big names. They love the Odell Beckhams. They love the, you know, Tom Brady's. They love the LeBron James, the Michael Jordans. And they, that's what American fans love to get behind. Whereas I always felt in rugby, you know, the guys who got themselves in the media a bit too much sort of got punished and tainted with a brush. If you look at the likes like Gavin Henson, Danny, Danny, Danny Cipriani, and, you know, even to me, to some extent, um, and it never really sat well, you know, you, you know, definitely with, like you said, there's a sort of underlying route in rugby where, you know, no one's bigger than the game and that sort of thing. But I think the way, because Americans view sport as a business as well, which has always sort of been hidden away from, from rugby. I felt in England anyway, it, it, it didn't, you know, whenever you spoke to a club, it was about, you know, having, you know, owing the club something and being loyal and that sort of thing. And then when it came the other way around, they were always like, oh, it's, not, it's nothing personal, it's business. And suddenly you're left you know, thinking, oh, what am I going to do with my life now? You know, rugby finish. And, and there is a conveyor belt of players coming through all the time. So, you know, it's daunting for me. And the first time I really felt that is I left, I left Northampton. And like you said, I didn't feel like I was done with rugby, but I felt, you know, I'd done 10 years with Northampton and I didn't fancy going off somewhere else in the premiership. So I knew I wanted to play away and I didn't like you. I didn't really fancy going to France and trying to speak another language. So America was calling and I came over here. But the, the thing is, with American sport, they just they just get it and they're gonna try and make it bigger and better. And I think it's important for it to grow here, but to grow in that American way. And so having the mascots, having, you know, people shooting cannons of t-shirts into the crowd. If you see what they're doing at Austin, you know, they're doing like halftime performances and things like that. And I think, you know, you haven't got to experience it yet, but the, the Legion fans, when you play at your home ground, which I don't think you can play at the moment, can you ever right. But that's sort of, you know, down and they all get dressed up in the old, like, you know, like gladiators and stuff. And it's awesome. And I love that. And I love that spin. And I think you're right that for it to take off over here, they need to make sure they hold on to the American. And I think America will, it could, it could change the face of rugby for everyone and everyone start viewing it like that. I think so. And look, there are there talks about, obviously, England coming over here. Now, obviously, USA team in Canada are going over to England, which, again, is just raising the profile of the game over here. And, what I also love about the, the difference here is the positivity. Like you said, it's that American spin. It's that kind of actually being nice and meaning it, not like a backhanded compliment. Oh, you look yeah. good. Oh, I wouldn't wear that kind of thing. <laughs> Whereas, I mean, the prime example was one of the guys actually had a, he did an engagement shoot, which is a lovely thing. He had some nice photos um, and he put it on the WhatsApp group himself and everyone was like, oh my God, you look amazing. It's brilliant. And you know, it's like, if that was back in the UK, you would almost be hiding that and one of the boys would find it and put it on a group and everyone would take the mick out of you, like yeah. how easy, all this kind of stuff. And it was just, 
it was nice. Everyone was like, <laughs> very genuinely happy for him. <clears throat> um, which again, is from coming from a UK rugby perspective where it's all about a bit of stick and banter and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, they, they like to lift you up here. They just keep on picking you up. I know, and that's awesome. Awesome view. Right, let's talk rugby in America. Obviously, you signed for us. <clears throat> there was a, a, a slight hiccup with the Barbarians, but it's, you know, I, you know, I was, I was very close, Robbo, from trying to get on that Barbarians, uh, in that Barbarians game, because I was in America already. I, I couldn't fly back. And uh, I know I'd have been in that restaurant with you, so I'm thankful <laughs> that I was in America. So anyway, you, you, that was a big, a big kerfuffle, but it's been sorted. They, they gave you a, a little ban. You serve your time. I know the boys would have been itching to get you on the field and get out there and play some rugby. You finally get out there. Uh, I, love, I love Houston's ground as well, because I mentioned you before you played, so it's a great place to play. Uh, and sadly, you know, you, you know, sod's law, you go into a tackle and pop your shoulder. Um, talk, talk me through like getting on the field and, the, and the, the time that you had on there, the brief time that you had on there. Yeah, so it was it was what I'd been looking for. I'd been training hard, trying to help the, the squad, the guys, and bring some of the experience I have through whether that be working with some great coaches to great players back in England or Harlequins, wherever it be. Um, and I'd been enjoying it. And firstly, I'd been really impressed with the standard. Yeah. I was a little bit unsure what to expect when I came because... I hadn't seen too much of it on TV. I'd seen a lot of highlight wheels and everyone looks a million dollars in highlight wheels, don't they? But <laughs> some people have said this and that. Um, and firstly, I've been really impressed with the standard. So yeah, I was looking forward to getting out there. Uh, Houston, great ground, did a captain's run uh, the day before. Played, yeah, 60 minutes into the game. I, I've carried the ball into combat. So the thing is, I haven't tackled someone, I've carried the ball in. And then as I've fallen, I put my arm down. It's just hyperextended and my shoulders popped out. And... I just knew I was in so much pain. I just knew. Um, and I just felt so so gutted for, obviously, the Legion um, coming over here and trying to get involved. And, yeah, luckily, the, we had a good match day doctor who put my shoulder back in. Um, but after having a scan and all that kind of stuff, doing my physiotherapy, it's the best it could have been without needing an operation. So, yeah. like I said, hopefully I'm back in about three weeks' time um, and we have a good run in towards the end of the year. So... Yeah, just, just devastated. It just felt um, a little bit of a fraud kind of thing. You'd come yeah. here, obviously. No, you can't I'm, listen, Robbo. You can't be a You know fraud. what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, I know, yeah. Well, you it's the anticipation. Kind of and and yeah. kind of contributing. And, and at least when I was banned, I was still doing every training session and you're kind of helping and you're doing the, as forwards, you're doing the scrums and the moors and the, the heavy hitting. Yeah. Whereas now it's been very much a, a rehab situation. And hopefully next week I can start to get back into rugby, which I, I miss. Yeah. I miss it. And you know what it's like when you're injured. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of injuries at the club and, and know, big yeah. injuries this season, unfortunately. You miss a game so much. You just miss being out there with your mates, training hard. And one of the things I actually really miss, and I didn't think I would, and I'm not sure if you're, you're the same kind of mentality as me, but it was those really hard training sessions, like with England or Saints, I'm sure, and you come out the other side, but you almost <laughs> fear them going in, but you come out the other side and you're like, yeah, we've done that. And then Someone would have been knackered and done something stupid and then they get teased for it. Uh, but all these kind of things. So, yeah, I, I miss the hard training for sure. Robbo, it just shows how different we are as, as <laughs> human beings and players. Um, you know, what I honestly, when... <clears throat> so I heard about Eddie Jones and how hard he used to run a camp. Uh, you know, I heard the Japanese players used to moan about him and in their culture, they don't moan about anything. So I knew that they ran a very hard camp. And when Eddie took over the, over the job... And, you know, I'd have been, you know, 31, 32 at the time. And honestly, I was petrified of getting the call and coming into camp, <laughs> petrified, because my knees were still a bit dodgy. I knew I wasn't that fit or as fit as I needed to be to be playing for England. And honestly, it used to, like, keep me awake, like, thinking the call would come in and I'd come into camp and everyone would be flying past me and all that. So, you know, that's probably why my... And I probably knew then that my England career was over. I was just scared to get back into it because... You know, when I was in the fold underneath Lanny and, 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 and Jono, you know, you have to be at the top of your performance. And, and when you get called into camp, you know, there's no places to hide and, and you have to be ready to go all the time. And, uh, you know, actually now being over here and having a bit of time and a bit of break and my body to recover, I actually feel better than I did in the last couple of years at Northampton, which is quite a weird thing to say, but I feel, you know, my body feels good and mentally I feel feel a lot better. So 
Um, yeah. So t- anyway, I want to talk to you about, you know, uh, you know, your wonderful England career, captaining England. What, because that's like, you know, every kid's dream. And obviously you played rugby, you know, went to Millfield, which is a very rugby prominent school. You know, your parents were into rugby. You were a rugby kid. Then you go up through the ranks, you play for your local team, Harlequins. You eventually get into the England team, which is a massive achievement on its own. And then suddenly you get a call one day from Lancaster who sort of says, right, Chris, I want you to be the leader of our troops, uh, you know, and, and, and be the captain of England. Um, you know, talk me through those emotions because obviously, well, talk me through the emotions of being selected for England first and foremost, because we did that sort of together, didn't we? I think we made our debuts, you know, in the same year anyway. Yeah, and so, then- well, I mean, that, that was huge. We were, um, so it's a similar year to how it is now where a lot of guys get called up to the Lions. And it was it was funny because there was a guy called Alan, Alan Quinlan, who was Irish, and he, he got banned just before the Lions thought he was supposed to go on it. And there was a guy playing for England ahead of me called Tom Croft. So then he got called up to the Lions, so I luckily got called up to the England side. And because of that, yeah, I got, I got to play away in Argentina, uh, which was an incredible experience and the passion they have for the game down there. And a lot of Argentinians over here in the league, I know you've got a couple, we have a couple uh, down with us in San Diego. Um, and it was just so special. I remember Martin Johnson, this figure I'd looked up to my whole life and idolised was, was now my coach. And he was the one kind of saying, we're going to start you this weekend, how do you feel? And as a, I mean, he still he was still a big man, and you'll know when he, when he got the team going, and when he got into them before games or in training sessions, it was it was quite scary. <laughs> uh, and you would do anything for that man. You would want to work hard and and go out. But yeah, he was he was great with me. Um, he just said, "Look, this game." Love holding the pads and stuff, didn't he, Robert? <laughs> this is getting the first coach I've ever seen who like once you can see that little that he played. Can you see like he was always on a bag and like hitting you guys and trying to get you to react and stuff. I always remember watching that thing. Thank God I'm not a forward because I don't fancy oh. Martin Johnson smashing me with a pad. Well, I, I remember when we went to, before that, we went to Australia, I think a year before. I'm not sure if you came, but we went to Australia and it was one of the sessions where I think it was the guys not playing were training and he was doing some training and sometimes the coaches would join in because they want to do it. And he was the best player on the pitch. <laughs> 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 and he would have been retired 10 years. He was taking high balls above his head, like running through, like like you said, on the tackle bags, knocking people back. Um, yeah, and he was phenomenal. But yeah, he gave my first one. But then unfortunately after that, we, we lost that game. But unfortunately after that, after that, the Lions guys came back um, and I had to wait two and a half years for that next opportunity, which, which then came with, with yourself as well. Um, my second game, captain in my country. A lot of these places I've never played in the Six Nations before, and then all of a sudden you're you're going out there to captain it, um, and that was it was a it was beyond anything I'd ever dreamt about. And I remember speaking to the guys, you, you probably won't even remember, but speaking to the guys in the first huddle after I'd been named captain, and Andy Farrell, the backs coach or defence coach, who captained rugby league at such a young age, like eighteen twenty, said it's all. It all gets easier now. And that's because you build that moment up in your head and then it's that first team talk or that first carry. And it's all the first things. And then once you've done that, you just kind of build your own game and keep moving forward. But for myself, and I think for a lot of people from the outside world, they never see, they see a captain as a one-person thing. They don't see like the good leaders you have around and, and people like Charlie Hodgson, yourself, Dylan Hartley were there, uh, Toby Flood. Uh, all these type of guys were so influential. Owen Farrell for the first time. Mm-hmm. Owen Farrell coming in as a probably being like a 20 year old coming yeah. into camp and, and being so vocal I remember he actually dropped his first ball and <laughs> in the training session and after that he just skyrocketed he just went off on again and just so commanding dominant um, he was brilliant but for me it's always been about listening to people and learning mm-hmm. it's always been trying to speak to other people so we you probably I don't know if you remember but when one of the first meetings we had Kevin Sinfield and Andy Strauss, who were the England cricket captain and the England rugby league captain at the time, just some of the key things they said. And one thing that Kevin Sinfield said that always stuck with me. And he said, what are you doing when no one's watching? He yeah. said, it's easy to do it when you get into England camp, when you're back at the club, but in the middle of the January, when you're sore and tired and it's raining outside, are you still doing recovery or eating protein shakes or uh, doing your extras when everyone's gone home? That's the time when the good players really excel. And, and for me, that was one of those things that always spurred me on. Yeah. Do, do, uh, do, I remember that Jamie Peacock came in and did one as well. Do you remember that one? Got to get off the bus. Yeah. I mean, his was, <laughs> his was brilliant. I mean, he was a tough guy, wasn't he? He was, yeah. 
And he said that he played that international and his opposite number was one of the best players in the world. He said he got the ball, first ball, he ran at him as hard as he can and he got smashed into the floor. And then he did it again and he got smashed into the floor. And he said he did it again and again. And by the eighth time, instead of getting smashed, he hit the guy and he fell off and he went through. And he said that's the kind of mentality sometimes you've just got to have as a leader. You said they won after that, didn't they? Yeah. He was, it's great listening to those guys as well because although rugby league's a different sport, you know, it's the same thing, you know, you sort of like that brotherhood, you know, being a leader on the field, off the field, uh, leading by your actions. Because, uh, you know, a great leader is someone who leads by their words and their actions, you know, walk the talk. Um, and, you know, you were always one of those guys, I felt anyway, just, you know, someone who always left it all out in the field. But I remember I tried to do a, so I captained Northampton for the last game I played for them. And, uh, we got the knock for the two minutes and I was like, right, I'm going to get the boys in and I'm going to do a big, you know, rousing <laughs> speech to try and get everyone riled up for my last game. And I spoke for about 25 seconds and I was stumbling and trembling and bumbling and tearing up and it was a nightmare. <laughs> Basically, we just, just gave up after 30 seconds and we turned and faced the door. And I was just thinking, like, Jesus, I'm like that for my last game for Northampton. Imagine if I ever, like, captained England in a... You know, <laughs> at Twickenham with all my family and the millions watching so uh you know credit to you guys who, who take that responsibility and, and you know because it is an emotional moment as well it's an emotional moment you're living out a childhood dream of you know playing for your country but then captaining your country leading your brothers players that you played with loads of times a few times players that looked up to you um you know it must be a, a really emotional time so tell me what it's like to stand you know I, I think you know one of the most special things about Playing is doing the national anthem. You face the big stand. You see how Twickenham packed out, and you can see your mum and dad in the seats just behind the coaches. Tell me about the emotions that you're going through for that. Yeah, exactly. And I always think kind of with with England for me, and I, I was lucky enough to captain my club as well for for numerous years. And and for me, I always found with England the best bit of the career is that a hundred minutes or slightly longer when you arrive at the stadium when it's just the best 15, the best 23 in your country against the best 23 in their country. You get off the bus, there's white shirts everywhere. <clears throat> you hear the people singing Swing Low, Jerusalem, all these type of things, the national anthem. And it's buzzing because as soon as you finish, as soon as you stop, you're doing the media, you're doing post-match appearances, you're trying to see your family and you forget. But as a kid, you always grew up wanting to play in the big stadiums against the best side in the world. And, and you get that opportunity. So yeah, look, you have your chat in the change room. A number of senior guys will speak, running out, and you see the flamethrowers going. It's just the noise. Mm. And then, yeah, lining up for the anthem. And what people don't know is your family always generally sit in front of you, don't they? Just by the tunnel when you, everyone's kind of scanning, and you're making some nice eye contact, and you're remembering who you're playing for. And I remember when I came, when I was about 18, for my 18th birthday, my mum got me and some friends some tickets to go to one of the games. And we were sat at the very top row in one of the corner stands. And it was incredible just being there and then to be on the pitch and singing it. And see, even as a kid, I used to sing the anthem at home on the TV. That was one of the big moments and building up to it. And then you're just into it. And then it's just not letting the moment pass you by and not thinking, oh my God, I'm playing against a Richie McCaw now or a, um, David Pocock or something like that. Because as soon as you let that moment slip, you're done. You're yeah. done. I, I remember... One of my first games for Harlequins, I played, I can't remember who we played, but there was a guy called Andrew Mertens, who was a New Zealand legend. There was a guy called Will Greenwood, who won the World Cup. There was a guy called Andre Voss, who was a South African captain, and, and many other kind of other, other internationals. And I was 19, and I was looking around and going, oh my God, I can't believe I'm playing with X, Y, and Z. And I was terrible. I was terrible. <laughs> I think mean, I was dropping the ball, and I think I probably came off at half time. And then after that, I was like, okay, never again. You've just yeah. got to be in the moment. You can't worry. Because uh, as soon as you think like that, you're letting people down. You're not doing your job. Um, and I think when you get to England, one of the best things as well is we battle against each other every week for 30 games to try win the championship. And you all come together for the same purpose. Yeah. Club rivalry goes away. And I always enjoy watching how different clubs train. I always like watching how a back rower from a Saracens or Northampton or anything does a breakdown drill yeah. and how can I learn from that and what can I give to him and that's one of the best things about being with England I think yeah uh it's it's funny you mentioned that as well because uh again like when I was a 
weirdly, when I was younger, when I was a younger player, <clears throat> especially when I was 20, 21 years old, and I get called into the sale team and I was playing on the wing, playing at nine somewhere, I never used to care about the team we were playing against. Never cared, you know, whether it was Justin Marshall playing at Saracens or whether it was, you know, Jason Robinson at fullback or whatever. I just didn't care. I, just, I was very blasé and I played my best rugby. And, and I always thought to myself, you know, the more I became, so I wasn't a rugby nut at all. I didn't really watch that much rugby. I used to enjoy playing it. I, hate, I didn't really, I've never really been one of the guys who enjoys training. I love playing at the weekends. I love the, I don't know, you know, being on stage, the stadium, the, the crowd and playing a game of rugby, 15 guys against 15 guys, the best win. And uh, as I got older and I started to become a bit more of a nose at rugby and sort of like watch a lot more rugby, pay a bit more attention, doing a lot, and obviously like film and studying came into it a bit more and you'd look at the opposition for chances. And as soon as I started doing that, I always thought that it's sort of like, <laughs> I'm scared like this. Yeah, I, was, I, I think, yeah, I think I was born in the wrong, in the wrong decade. You know, if I was born like in the, in the sixties and was playing in the eighties when it was sort of like just getting towards professional, but wasn't too professional. <laughs> That's the area where I'd have been like a, an 80 capper, but um, sadly it wasn't to me, but you know, I loved my career and I loved, playing rugby, like you said, for the same things, playing for England, those magical moments of, of 80,000 people singing, sitting in the stadium and that sort of stuff. But let's bring it back to, to America and the MLR. Oh, just on that, I think that's, for me, that's the thing you miss though. I don't know what you feel like. Playing is great, mm -hmm. but you cannot replicate running out in front of 80,000 and the no. bars gives you when, especially someone like, I didn't score many tries. <laughs> like you who's, who's made a break in, I don't know, skinned a fullback or a winger and you dot down and 80,000 people are up and you throw the ball or whatever. And it's just, that is, if you could somehow bottle that, you'd be a very rich man. Oh, mate, I, I have the opposite though. Can you remember when we played against New Zealand and I intercepted Mar Nonu on our 22? You gave away the penalty. You <laughs> gave away a penalty for being offside. And I ran out and intercepted Mar Nonu and then went 80 metres <laughs> in the post. No one chased me. And I was giving it the big <laughs> in the air. And then everyone's like, shut up, you idiot. <laughs> Call back. I, you haven't forgiven me yet. I remember. Oh, okay. I remember. I remember watching going, who, who gave away that penalty? <laughs> I was like, oh, God, you've probably killed me. But yeah, um, you're, you're completely right, though. There is no replica for that. And that's why, I, you know, because I sound a bit stupid saying that I was scared of Eddie Jones calling me. And I should probably like go into a bit more detail in that. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact that I was scared to go and play for England. I just, knew that if I was going to play for England, I'd want to be at my best mm. and I'd want to play at my best because when I would played for England in the past, I played at my best and I felt so confident in myself, so confident in my body that I could perform to my best. And I just thought, you know, if they did call me in, you know, and I just saw that, the, you know, the new face, Brownie had sort of cemented himself in there and I sort of fell behind towards the end. And I did my ACL leading up to that 2015 World Cup and it sort of put me out of that. And, so I was a bit off the pace and, and, and off the uh, sort of off the radar, so to speak. But I did get a phone call from Eddie, and I just thought, you know, I think I think I'm done because my self belief had gone, and, and that sort of was the end. Anyway, we're going to bring it back to uh, the MLR because what I wanted to talk to you about is obviously you've mentioned already San Diego flooded by injuries, a lot of moving around. Now you're back in San Diego. But what I want to know, Robbo, is you've mentioned you're impressed with, you know, the the level of rugby, the level of training. And it's always, and that's what I was impressed with when I first came. It wasn't because, you know, I thought, oh, we're going to have a few you know, Mickey Mouse players and stuff. But actually the, the guys are really willing to learn. They're very enthusiastic and their, their skill levels are getting better and better every year. And you can see that in the standard of play. But what I want to know is San Diego is who are the, you know, the rising stars? Who are the quiet ones? You know, who are the guys? Because I'm always talking about if America is going to be big in this sport, they've got to have a few pinups. They've got to have, you know, guys coming through the system, guys coming through that draft system from colleges, joining teams like San Diego and, and coming through, you know, at the age of 24, 25 and becoming stars of the game. So who are the future stars of San Diego? Who's the American guys who are really going to be coming through? Yeah, I would, I would like to think there's a couple at the club. Um, there's a couple of guys who can, who can push on. I think Sam Wuching, a uh, big physical back rower. Mate, um, I love watching Sam. He's been awesome. And, and, and in a team that struggled, he has yeah. been a shining light. He just, he just, he's one of those players who is invaluable just to get go forward, just yeah. to get the game line. He takes two or three people to stop him, and I think he's one of the guys who people don't know could have potentially gone into the NFL. Was up to the draft system, all that kind of stuff. So he picked the game up very late, and the level he's got to now and his potential. And I would, I would love to actually see him. I've no doubt he'll 
he'll be in that USA mix to go up against England, go up against uh, Ireland, I think they're playing as well, mm-hmm. and just challenge himself because that's that's another thing. And I think the league is shorter here. And like you said, for, for players like ourselves, it, it's great that because it allows you time off. You feel a little bit fresher. You have another six months to potentially work out somewhere else. I think for a lot of these players to really develop, it's a good opportunity for them in that off-season to potentially go to the UK, to go to New Zealand, to go to South Africa for a couple of months and really, really develop their skill sets, train. Maybe they don't play, but maybe they go on a training base where they're playing with Northampton and just training every single day and seeing how it works, just to get that more experience in themselves. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, I don't know if you saw, but I went and played in the Bermuda 10s competition and there was talks of that running in the off-season to be sort of like the Japan to the MLR, so Japan is to the Super Rugby, that would be our Japan. So hopefully everything's sort of, there's so much up in the air here. It's one of the reasons why I came because I just saw so much potential. It was very rough and raw. And if rugby picks up here, you know, Robert, you'll know like me as well. And You've got good friends like Danny Kerr and Mike Brown and, you know, guys who played the game for a long time. And, you know, I'm friends with Dylan Hartley and Chris Ashton and those guys. We all finish the career and we all think, what are we doing next? And like, oh, there's only some of us that can become coaches because you either want to do that or you don't. And then a lot of us turn to sort of punditry and, and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, there's only one channel that shows rugby in England and that's BT Rugby and that's it. And then... Yeah, that's it for the rugby. Then there might be ITV every now and then, where's the internationals, but that's sort of always, you know, Clive Woodward, Johnny Wilkinson, you know, you have to be a great to be involved in that. Whereas here, you know, when it gets going, San Diego will have their own channel of rugby. Do you know what I mean? And, and so will New York and so will Utah and so will, you know, all these other. And it's, so, it's such a big place that when sport really does take off here, and even if it gets 10% of the traction of the NFL, do you know what I mean? Like, the money behind the NFL is so astronomical. I heard that <clears throat> every year they renegotiate their TV rights, it triples. And, you know, they're talking billions of dollars already. So if we could get a fraction of that money, you know, 5%, 6%, 10%, trying to get a big TV deal with Fox Sports, with BSPN, with a, uh, a, a NBC, is it? And, and <clears throat> I just feel that once that injection comes from TV money and the fans get in the stands, you know, we could, there's just going to be so much potential for us who've been around the game to use our experience whether it's in you know whether it's on the tv whether it's in coaching whether it's you know looking at commercial opportunities getting involved with sponsorship or you know all sorts of things I just that's what I came here to do really what are your ambitions with yeah, coming over here I think I think so with, with that as well and look COVID is has played things with with all leagues and all businesses all over the world and and we like everyone else in the MLR are adapting and yeah. it's 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 playing especially at San Diego we're playing here there and everywhere and and trying to do the best we can at the moment and I think when you talk about it is great it is growing from what I've seen from when you first came to where it is now and and where it is going but these things take time these things take time and the premiership in England has began 26 years professional and that's not even perfect that, yeah. That's still working out issues here and there. And it's a good model. Don't get me wrong. It's a very yeah. good model. But there's still things. And, and this league's been going four years. So it, it does have a little bit of time to go. But in doing so, we came over here very open-minded. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very much about the rugby first and foremost, but also looking at that next opportunity. I'm 34 now, uh, similar to you. And you can't play forever. As much as we all would like to and we all dream about it, the day does come where... You earn well, but you don't earn enough to go sit on a beach and relax for the rest of your life. You need to get another career and another profession doing something. And I think the league here playing the 16 games or whatever it is, the six months on, six months off, just worked out really well for me that I can try and plan what to go next. Camilla does a lot of singing back in the UK because she does the NFL when it's in the UK. She sings there. And a lot of her big stuff is towards the end of the year as well. So then that kind of worked well that hopefully we can balance our time a little bit between the West Coast here and then back in London. Um, but look, we're very open-minded. Is that, the, is that the way you're going to play it? You, you feel like you're going to bounce back and forth for the next couple? Of, I know you've signed for two years, maybe even yeah. three. Uh, is that the way you're going to play it? You do like sort of six months here, six months back in England and sort of bounce between the two? Yeah, I think so. I think that that's very much a plan, especially with, with a kid on the way. 
Yeah. Um, so I think we have kind of grandparents and all that kind of stuff. We wouldn't want to... Passports, like, like your style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was speaking to someone that the, the other day, actually, and they were saying about the amount of players coming here now whose kids were going to have an American passport. <laughs> that hopefully in 18 years or so, they're thinking, could they be playing for America? Um, so we'll have to wait and see. Exactly, Roro. <laughs> You're forward thinking, thinking, yeah, you know what? There could, rugby could be a massive market in 18 years. So talk about the premiership being 26 years old. Jesus, well, it'd be frightening to see where rugby <laughs> be in, in America in 18 years' time. Um, I'd have, I have to ask you about, you know, obviously you were originally the only West Coast, West Coast, West Coast team. But then, you know, the guys above you, the LA Guiltini suddenly pop up. Is there going to be a rivalry, hopefully, between you and them over the oncoming years? Because, you know, San Diego have always been a, the, a big side. Obviously, this is the, it's, it's very bizarre for me to look at a table and see San Diego to be sitting towards the bottom rather than the top, because that's where they've always sort of sat. But LA have sort of come in and they are, you know, they're sort of showing off now because they've just hired the uh, Sophia Stadium or whatever it's called, the, their new stadium. Well, they were until the weekend, though, weren't they, folks? Exactly, mate. <laughs> I, you know, I run water. <laughs> the best place. Yeah, but but is they? Do you, do you reckon they'll? You know, do you reckon that'll be something that will start panning out? A little rivalry between LA and 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 San Diego. I hope so. I mean, a, a Californian rivalry. Uh, unfortunately, they they beat us pretty convincingly when we went up there. Um, but yeah, look, they've definitely come in and and, and made some noise. Obviously, Gitter, Ashley Cooper. They're running the show and pulling the strings and um, being quite flamboyant, but they've been backing it up on the pitch, and it's it's hard to kind of argue with that. And and it is making noise. They are helping to make noises around the world as well with the league, which is always good. From a California point of view, of course, there's going to be a rivalry, and that's what you want in sport, don't you? You see it in other American sports. You see it when you guys used to play Leicester or Aspe Sounds, and everything's just lifted. It's a little bit more tense. Training means a bit more in the week. There's a little bit, a little bit more edge. Um, so yeah, that is definitely something that is going to grow and grow. Um, and hopefully, one of, the reasons, one of the reasons I ask you that is because I spoke to Danny Kerr last week, and I said, "Is there any interest, Danny, coming over?" And he said, "Oh, you know, that LA team that sort of popped up now, and they seem to be, you know, throwing it around a bit, winning, winning well." And he said he could be tempted over there. So I thought it, it would be interesting if we saw Danny come over in the next year or so. And uh, yeah, you know, I can see him over here. here. I mean, who, they've got a good nine at the moment. Uh, uh, yeah, Harrison Goodard's very good. And, yeah. and actually, they let go of um, Nick Boyd, who went to Houston, who's been... Houston, who played very well against them. Played, played, played very well, yeah. He's, he sort of sparked them yeah. back into life because they went through that point where they didn't score a point for, for two games and then suddenly, he, I think they won the next game. So he's been electric. And same with um, uh, Mika Cruz for Utah. Um, they let him go and he's been carving up for, for Utah and, and doing really well in the 13 shirt. So LA, um, I think they had some problems with the salary cap. I think their, their, their owner, uh, Mr. Gilchrist, is just uh, you know finding ways around it. And I think he got caught out and had to let a few players go. So that's why those guys left. I think, um, yeah, look, there's definitely going to be a rivalry there for sure. And, and like I said, hopefully we'll get back. But on, on Danny and other guys, look, I'm, no doubt there'll be more people coming at yeah. some point. Whether it's... I, I, tell me this, Robert, how many... How many guys have slipped into your, your DMs on Instagram and say, what's it like, Robbo? What's, they always say, the, the first things they always say, is, what's it like? Should I come over? What's the cash like? And, and <laughs> The three big questions. The three big uh, questions, yeah. Yeah, look, I've, I've had a, a fair few, especially, especially when guys aren't going well back home. Yeah. And they're thinking just mentally, again, in those kind of winter months where it's cold. And I know it's pretty cold over there on the East Coast, but over here on the West Coast. We're all good now. We're into, we're into spring and it's nice training. We're in singlets and all that sort of stuff. It's nice now. I remember when, I, when we first got here and we were touching base and I was like, oh, the pitches are so hard, like, especially being in the middle of the desert. And you're like, yeah, ours are frozen. We're like shoveling snow off them every day. <laughs> I was like, there's such a contract. We were getting sunburned. Yeah. That's one of the things with New York because, yeah, the West Coast, with San Diego, California, it's pretty hot all the way through, whereas... The seasons in New York are like really seasonal. So when it's autumn, it's like all the leaves are falling. It's like windy and, you know, a little bit of a chill in the air. But when it gets to winter, it is freezing bloody cold, like where you go outside and it hurts your face to walk down and breathe in the air. So, yeah, it was a, 
training in in January, February is is, is pretty minging, especially here on the East Coast. But once you can get through that, get through to the March months, and then <laughs> then it's plain sailing, mate. And then yeah, at least at least you know what you're going to get. You know that that was the rubbish thing in England is that when you trained, you know, you, even in the middle of spring or summer, you didn't know what the weather was going to be like. You could wake up one morning and it'd be a hissing rain. So um, at least you know what you're getting over here. Right, Robbo, I'm gonna, we're going to call it there because obviously we've, we've been chatting for ages and I know that I could literally talk to you about a million and one things. So I'm going to let you go. Go and enjoy yourself. Get recovered. I'm desperate to see you back on the field. I'm desperate to see sort of San... Because I think San Diego, they're sort of at a clinical point now where it's like, right, are we, is there a little bit too more distance? I know, because I, I, know, I know a bit of inside information on you boys as well that you're recruiting and getting a few more guys over to beef up the pack and few guys coming over and playing Paddy Jackson being one who you already announced, but I know a couple of other guys are coming over. So I'm interested to see how your season, you know, you could really make a run of it when you come back, Nate's back, JP's back, you know, you could make a run of it. I think you're a, you're still, you're still a dark horse. No, look, I think so. Look, things, things haven't gone smooth sailing for us and we've had a, a number of setbacks, but it's, it's time for us, like you said, to, to put things right, hopefully. And uh, firstly for myself, I, I'm, I'm dying to get back out there. Um, I've enjoyed off the field and stuff, but I very much want to be back on the pitch and helping the team as best I can. So, yeah, look, hopefully we'll see you guys again at some point. Um, not, not in suits and in some rugby. Some in rugby, rugby apparel. And then maybe we can have a shirt on for afterwards and have a beer after this COVID's hopefully gone away and we can sort of enjoy ourselves as well. Because that is all such a part of rugby as well. Obviously, like, I've always been at training, the culture and stuff. I mean, that's one thing I really liked about being in America as well, going to all these different states, seeing different players, people that you know, some people you don't know, having a beer, seeing what that's about as well. I've missed that. So hopefully that'll open up soon and I can show you, i show you New York, Robbo, and hopefully when you'll come over here or I'll come over to you and uh, we'll have a beer like the olden days and chew the fat. Talk about the great music. Yeah, we'll <laughs> get the rugby. We'll talk about the singing. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Robbo. Always a pleasure. Cheers for your time. Pleasure, mate. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little us does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. Well, it was great picking the brains of uh, Lucas Rumble, a man living up to his uh, reputation of Rumble, young man Rumble. Um, you know, he's a rock and, and been awesome for Toronto. Um, and then obviously Chris Robshaw, um, you know, uh, Danny Kerr said it last week, not the, not the best introduction, one game, one tackle, one dislocated shoulder. But um, we'll see him back soon. And, you know, he's, he's got a lot on his plate anyway. His, uh, his uh, fiance, his, his wife, Camilla, is, is about to have, uh, have a baby. So he's going to become a dad. So he's got plenty of his plate to get on with. But I uh, mentioned to, to Lucas, Mike, while I was in the uh, interview about the um, recent announcement from uh, the RFU back in England that England are going to play um, Canada and America in the summer uh, at Twickenham, which will be, be great for, for the teams, for both the American team and the Canadian team to go over there and play. Um, but I mentioned the Rumble, it's happening at the start of July. And obviously the MLR now are aligned with American rugby and obviously they must be have conversation with Canadian, uh, Canada rugby as well. But it's going to come at a very sort of, especially with the East Coast, how it's looking, a very crucial point of the season, probably the last two fixtures. Are you going to be missing some of your star players from your MLR teams? And, you know, especially, I, the reason I brought it with, with Rumble especially is because Toronto, are, you know, they must feed Canada at least half their team. So, you know, 11, 12 players disappearing from your starting lineup. That's a big sacrifice and big holes to fill. And I'm just wondering how 
the MLR is going to navigate those very choppy waters. And obviously you've been involved with international rugby and it's the pinnacle of every rugby player's career. You want to play for your country. You want to play against some of the best teams in the world. The opportunity to go to England and play at Twickenham is a, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity. So you're always going to say yes as a player. But, you know, these MLR teams who invest a lot of money, a lot of time, and it's all about winning and, and you know, creating a legacy and creating history and getting foundations and building a fan base as you knew about by winning games. Suddenly they're going to be out, be without their star players for two weeks. How's, how's this going to go down? I, first of all, how awesome for those two t teams to go out and play at Twickenham. I mean, I, I have to be honest, I'm jealous, never had that chance, never had that opportunity, but when you get these Lions tours in the years that the best players from those places like England, for instance, are off and away, it gives an opportunity for the players trying to break into the England side to have a shot at tier two nations like us. Like I know we've played Wales and Ireland in similar circumstances, but we always hosted them. We never got to go there and play in the big stadiums. And I saw, I think on BBC that they're actually going to have some fans at Twickenham as well, yeah. up to probably 10,000 fans, which is, I mean, what, what an, what an experience that's going to be for them. And like you said, as a player, you could, there's no way you're going to say no to that yeah. sort of thing, right? Like that's, that's just once in a lifetime, unbelievable shot to not only play in a historic venue, but play against some of the best teams in the world. So, but it does leave, especially a team like Toronto in quite a predicament, yeah. right? I mean, that's basically, I mean, to, I, I, without knowing offhand exactly how many of their players are Canadian internationals, it's, it's going to be very tricky for them. And like you said, it comes at a pivotal point in the season, right towards the end of that finish line. I, I don't know how that's going to be managed. I, I'd be curious to see how this all starts to unfold. I hope that the, I hope that the players are not left in a situation where they feel like, whatever they do, they're making the wrong decision and they're letting somebody down, right? Because yeah, that's... yeah, exactly. An experience like that, you want to, you don't want to be hesitant. You want to be right. feeling confident you're making the right decision. And that's, I, and I'm pretty sure that because the MLR are aligned with USA Rugby, the conversations have been had and, and you know, there, there's going to be something coming in the next couple of weeks that will sort of, you know, hopefully right. navigate, like I said, these choppy waters. And it is a difficult time, but, but, you know, for American rugby to grow on an international stage is so important for them to take these sort of games and these opportunities to go and play tier one rugby, uh, tier, tier, one, tier one rugby teams like England and see how we fare, you know, see how the MLR is doing at generating players and, you know, are the young talent coming through? Be I'm, you know, I'd be very excited to see what kind of squad USA announced, which new players they're bringing in because it seems to me that a lot of, on the past as well, they lent on a lot of, guys that have been in the American squad and knew what they were going to get out of them. Whereas I think they can be a little bit more ballsy in their selection process, you know, with guys like Connor Mooneyham and, and, and players like that coming through. I think that, you know, they can, they can send a team that it's always a big ask to go to Twickenham and beat England. I know they've had a few players away from the Lions, but I think that America could surprise a few people and it'll be a closer run for game than everyone thinks. Well, don't forget too, they're, they're going to be players that are in form right now. Like they're, they're not just playing a higher standard of rugby. They're playing currently in major league rugby. And so for us in the States, when we were predominantly relying on the June tests and November test window, the November test was like hardly anybody was playing rugby at that point yeah. in time. There were only a few teams around the country that were actually playing. And so you get a, a group of guys that rock up or a group of players that rock up to that test and you know, you get five days together before you start to play. And at that point, half the team's not even match fit because some guys haven't even played in quite some time. June's a little bit different because we were coming off of a predominantly spring heavy season here in the States. So as we rolled into June, a lot of people were sort of match fit. Uh, but it'll be really interesting to see like right in the thick of the season when some of these players are, you know, kind of like you said, it, it raced to the finish line at their prime, hungry, eager. Be cool to see them all come together and you know, have a shot at the likes of, of England at Twickenham. I think that's going to be a, a sight to be seen. And I, and I think, again, we talked about the eyes of the world watching American rugby. I think that's an opportunity for the eyes of the world to be kind of seeing exactly how MLR has sparked talent. But, but that said, I mean, you know, ha, has it really though too, I, I, the different conversation for a different time uh, about, 
you know, the MLR and the development of American players and how that's sort of working. And, and you know, for Toronto, it is because the, the, most of their Canadian internationals are playing there. But um, but anyway, the the bigger thing here is that I think, like you said, you just don't want players to feel like hesitant in this situation. You don't want them to feel like they're letting somebody down if they don't go yep. on to international duty. And you don't want them to feel like if if they, you know, leave their team their professional team and they do decide to go that they're letting people down i think yeah that's the last thing but but you guys in new york are going to struggle too because you have what just think about your forward pack i mean you got Fawcett, breakley savetta um who else is in that forward you got Fawcett, breakley savetta uh bonasso is american eligible he's been playing really well yeah hanko and hanko right hanko at six i knew there was a back that like it, it, sorry hanko okay and i knew there was a back row with those so that's you know potentially five of your forward packs because I, I, I do think benasso has been playing well right so that's potentially yeah. five of your forwards gone you know and the at interesting thing point. is the, the interesting thing is obviously there's the international rule you're going to have 11 internationals in your squad uh for a match day but if you're taking away you know, like you say, five or, you know, Toronto 12 or whatever their players, some, you know, some positions, especially in the front row and second row, like, like we're going to lose, they're hard, hard gaps to fill. And, and they're pretty, you know, skill specific. You know, you need a, you need a, a line out caller in the line out, um, you know, hookers who know how, you know the system or know your calls. Um, so it's hard to go and just pick up a guy from a local rugby club who you think might have a bit of potential and chuck him in because, you know, they're pretty, skill specific positions so uh it's going to be interesting to see what happens and, and i think there will be some changes and the different allowances that allow you know and and i think i think it will be dealt with in the correct way in, in terms of you know the boys will if you're selected it'll be a, a clap and a pat on the back from the team and cheer and you know watch them at the weekend when they go and play the international games because that's the way it should be everything should be geared towards international that's why you know, we're talking about growing the game from grassroots and getting it in high school, getting in college, get this league as big as possible. But the end goal is to produce American talented players, homegrown players who go and play from America, who become sort of stars, pin up internationally wide, go to World Cups, try and compete for those. And, and this is the start of the process. Yeah, agreed. But but speaking of, uh, I, forget, I forget the exact word that you use, but like the, the limitation on the number of foreign players you can use, New York is allowed 11. Yeah, you created one of your draft picks. Ah, you traded, right. Yes. So you traded trend. the chance to take American talent out of the Amer first ever American draft. New York trades their pick <laughs> and trades it for an international slot. And right. the rest of the teams have to stick with 10. Right. So, okay. So we're lucky that we're at 11. So yeah, you're at 11. You're, we got you're Connor 11. Buckley. We knew who we wanted. We got Connor Buckley. We knew who we wanted. <laughs> um, Anyway, let's move on to next week's game. It is a very interesting talking point, and I'm sure hopefully a bit of light and spreading it over the next couple of weeks and we can pick up back this conversation. But into next week's fixtures, um, some good, some good matchups. Uh, we'll start with Toronto um, heading off to the Sabercats. Um, both teams coming off the back of uh, losses. Um, I think Toronto will, will, will take that one. I think that they'll bounce back. Um, like we said, we like Houston. We like where they're building and what they're doing. But I just think they leak too many points. I think Toronto will be disappointed with the way they lost the game against Atlanta. And they'll be stingy in defense. Uh, and and we already know that Houston have a little bit of problem with um, stopping the points leaking in. So I think Toronto will run away with that one over in Houston. I, I hesitate to agree, but I think that I will. I do think that Houston at home, they've been playing well. I think that they might be able to manage to get this one over on Toronto, but um, I am going to go with Toronto because I do think that, like you said, I, I, I think they ran close this week with Atlanta. They've shown what they're capable of. I, I believe in that team right now, and I believe that they can do a job down there in Houston this weekend. Uh, and it, I'll, it, one I can't really comment on, it, but it's uh, New York versus Austin Gilgronies. Uh, down at Austin, uh, the Little Brothers, uh, you know, looking for revenge after their big brother's just been beaten up by the New York boys. Um, you know, on Austin lost lost at the weekend as well. It's another East Coast side, but they're a tough side, Austin. I think at home, you know, they're they're a bit of a beast. And what they're doing there, I like. I like their team. I like what they're doing. 
But I still, you know, obviously I think that we're going to win. <laughs> the confidence we're going to have from this game, I think, you know, obviously I'll let you, I'll let you dive into order a little bit more. I, I can't ever pick against New York again. That's it. I can't, I can't do it. I, I thought for sure, I thought for sure if there was ever only one game that I could potentially like, people would be, be like, all right, I, I get it. You're picking against New York. You're picking Los Angeles, right? That was the yeah. only game that I probably could get away with it. You know, in any other circumstance, people would be like, "How um, could you do that? How, yeah, how could you do that? You have some nerve to pick up, pick against New York." But I'm still, I'm still like, you've got some nerve, Mikey. I don't know. Yeah, if you got, yeah, well, I'm more well, smug though. I'm smug because we won. Look, I was wrong. I was totally, totally wrong. I was absolutely wrong. Hundred percent bad call by me. Really, really excited though because I mean, look at, at my heart, I always want New York to win, right? So mm, of course, that's that's you're, you're a New Yorker through and through. Right, that's what I mean. Like I want New York to they'd throw up to me. They'd be just it would be an uneventful league because New York would win every game. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't sit here and do that, right? I can't. That that's that's not right. Uh, but I do think that I do think that you all will go down to Austin and win. Uh, you know, I, I, I laugh a little bit when I hear you call Austin the, the little brothers because they must be, they must like make them boil when they I know, yeah, yeah. They just, yeah, it must make they them just boil. must go over an edge. Listen, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sprinkling some spice on it. You know, yeah, I, like, I like to add some spice. Just, Give them a reason. Fires in the locker room right exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Give them some fuel. Well, I love all that. You know, I love all that. No, I love, I love Austin. I think they're doing great. Anyway, uh, next game, uh, probably, I think probably one of the biggest games of the week. Um, just because East Coast clash, Free Jacks, um, who uh, I got a good win against Austin last week, and they're playing Atlanta at Atlanta. Um, I think that's going to be a heck of a game. I think it's going to be a real physical, real nuggety game. Um, and I, to be honest, I think Atlanta could land on the right side of it. I mean, they've been, it's probably the first time they've sort of, had a close game and landed the right side of it. It was at the weekend and, and hopefully they can, you know, take confidence from that because I, I said earlier, actually the other way around, I said, if, if New England can find themselves in it, they're turning into a team that can really grind out wins. Um, but I just think, I just like Atlanta at the moment. I like, I don't know. I like Mark O'Keefe, Ross Deacon. I like, you know, the, I like the fullback they've just put in as well. He looks sharp and quick. He got a kick charge down. Um, but, you know, he looks elusive and an exciting player to get behind. And so I just think they've got, I think they've got a few more bullets to fire than, than the Free Jacks. But saying that, you know, Free Jacks have got Dougie Fife who scores every game. So that's one try they can put down next to the nose. I'm sure Dougie Fife crosses the line at least once. Um, but I just, yeah, it's going to be a real close game and it can really change the way the table looks because Atlanta need to catch up with the likes of uh, the Free Jacks. And if they can get that win, and suddenly it flips over and it's all back to play for. But I think if New Jack, if if the Free Jacks can win, that's a little bit more distance between them and LA. I'm not LA, sorry, Atlanta. And then we'll sort of see that separation we've been all been waiting for in the East Coast League. Atlanta absolutely has a lot to play for, and I do like what they're doing. But I think I'm going to go again to just kind of for Ooh, fun because just fun. kind of for fun because this could go either way, and I, and I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised could. if Atlanta wins. But I I'm. We've been on the same page so far, but just to just to mix things up a little bit, I'm gonna go with New England because because why not? Because I do, <laughs> I do think it could go either why way. Why not? Yeah, it I could. It really it could. could. It's no so you know, you win Atlanta. I'm gonna go New England. This All right, this, what, know, this is the one I've been waiting to ask you about. This is the one I've been waiting to ask you about. Utah versus LA. LA back at home. Utah after a big win. They jumped up, caught a few points up. They're second now in that West Con Co uh, Conference League. Could we see? Could we see them claw? You know, a little damage confidence. You know, they've been knocked out once, like a, a bruised boxer. They're going to suffer from a bit of concussion, and maybe a, you know, man, maybe they got a glass jaw now. The LA Guiltinis and uh, you know, look, people are looking at them, thinking, oh, they're not invincible, and maybe they can knock them out. What do you think? I don't know. You definitely found the kink in their armor. That's for sure. I, that, I'll go, let's call a spade a spade. You found the kink in their armor, but I, you know, I have to be honest, they're probably nursing themselves back to health on the beach there in Los Angeles. They're probably not, you know, they, you know, although you guys did put quite a hurting on them. You really did. That was a really physical game. And, and I'm sure that that was a pretty miserable plane ride back to Los Angeles with a lot of time to think uh, about what could have been for sure. But I, you know, I look, this could go either way, right? This could be one of those situations where you've kind of, you've poked the sleeping giant, like, the, like yeah. you poke the monster a little bit. And I like, know. 
really irritated them <laughs> and, they, and they just like take it out on Utah. They just have, they score like a hundred points uh, this, <laughs> this weekend. Right. Or it could be a situation where, like you said, they just, they, they roll over and they're like, well, you know, maybe they start to get into a bit of a slump and Utah is on a bit of a high and they roll into town and, and give them what for and how come they're like climb up the table slowly, but surely. But I be honest, Mike, you're like me, you know, like I know, LA, LA all the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think if Gitto's back, like you said, they're going to be hurting. They're back at home. They, they're all be rolling on their 73, whatever yeah. called bikes, brought up to trading. They'll have a little bit of, a, and I think, do you know what I mean? Uh, it's good. Good for a good team to get humbled when they start getting a bit above the station. Um, the worst thing to do is go into knockout rugby where you think you're invincible and then something happens and you like, you're not used to it where they, you know, the first time that a team's really been in it till half time with them and then suddenly it's been, you know, a game that's sort of won by a kick or a kick here and there. And they needed to experience that and they didn't, and they didn't fall the right way of the sort of result that they wanted, but it'll give them the awakening that they need. And I think that they will, they'll, they'll, I won't say they'll thump Utah because I do like Utah. I think Utah are playing good, a good rugby, but I just think LA will, yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll write a few yeah. wrongs at the, the you, you and I, you and I are on the same page here. That's I, but, but that said, I would love to see Utah win. I really would. Like I oh, said, yeah. it would I'm make, not, it would make it a lot more interesting on that West yeah. coast side. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see Utah win. Um, next game is Nola at San Diego of San Diego struggling and Nola getting a good win. It's a long way to travel though for Nola. Um, this is the weird thing about San Diego and Seattle because we both know that they have it in them to, to really mess up other people. And we sort of said, like, is it too late for them now to turn their seasons around? Are they just trying to build blocks to get themselves in good positions for next year? But what they can do is just turn it on for one game and really mess it up for other guys who are trying to run hot. Nola are at the top of the East Coast Conference now. And it's very important that they go away and get a result, especially with the result of Rooney beating L.A., can San Diego do it at home? I, I, you've lost, I'd you've love, lost faith of you. Yeah, faith. I'd, I'd love to say yes. I just, I think that, like you said, I think that every game is so meaningful right now to these teams in the Eastern Conference. Nola knows that they have to go out there and they have to win. You know, I mean, every, every point matters. And so I think Nola is... I, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that they're like playing great rugby overall, right? Like some of these other teams yeah. like they're playing fantastic rugby, but they're finding a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so I think even though they're going on that long trip to San Diego, I think they'll find a way to make it work. I do. And I think that they'll come out and, and beat San Diego this weekend. I'm going to go against you. I think San Diego have it in them. I say that purely as a selfish reason, because obviously I want, <laughs> I want San Diego to win. <laughs> No, but I, I, I think well, they have it in them. Gone, you should have gone with Nola because yeah, you didn't yeah. give them that. that, that I, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, 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 backing, I'm backing San Diego. I just think they have it in them. And I think that, you know, long trips like that, they do play their part. They do play their part. And I think that San Diego have been at home now, back in San Diego for two or three weeks. Things are getting back to normal. They're getting a little bit more settled. Hopefully, you know, we'll start seeing the San Diego of old where they, you know, tactically they're very astute and defensively they're very stingy. And if, if they do that, then, then Nola could struggle, but yeah, Nola definitely have it in them to win and, and they, they have it in them to win. Well, that's the yeah. thing. But I think if it comes in a dog fight and gets close, I think San Diego take it, but there is the, I think there is the, the risk that Nola come there and, and blow them out the water. And the last game is Seattle versus DC at DC. Um, it's important that DC win. I just put that out there. It's important that they win because if they don't, the, the distance is starting to come between them and the rest of the guys in the East Conference. Um, so it's an important game for them. Seattle, you know, they've got, I think it's their first win they got at the weekend. They'll take confidence from that. Are their hearts in it though? Are they, you know, are they wanting to like really get down and grit it out and, and Put in a hard performance. They've got to travel a long way as well to DC. Uh, and DC are a good side. They're tough. And so is Seattle. But it's just about how much Seattle won it compared to DC. Because DC know it's a must-win game for them if they're going to stick around in this East Conference. 
Must win game for DC, like you said. I just want to see that East Coast conference just be a total mess at the end of the season. <laughs> like so, so I like I am so psyched for that. So I want I want DC to win because I just want that whole thing to be just a complete disaster. And like going into the last weekend, everyone's like the last place team could literally end up first <laughs> <laughs> the last weekend. So I, I I'm gonna go with DC. I'm gonna kind of will them to win here to just yeah. continue to make things interesting because I don't want to see that, that, like you said, that breathing room developed in the table. I just want to see everything real tight throughout there on the Eastern conference. Yeah. I think, I think DC, I think they have to edge it. I think that Seattle will go down there and, and, and be a pain in the ass for them. But I think being at home and just the level importance on the game, I think DC will realize that they need, it's a must win game for them. Uh, while other teams are taking points from the West coast teams, they have to do the same if they're going to stick around. Um, so, yeah, I'll go with you there as well. I think that uh, DC will, will nick it. And that's all. That's all of the games. That's all we have to look forward to. You know, what a, what a season we're having so far. It's just uh, you know, all panning out as we expected, right? It's, look, I, <laughs> I mean, this past weekend, I, I can't even get over those scores, though. I mean, I know we talked about that already. But I just feel like with the exception of the weekend, like what, two weeks ago now at this point, where there was some some big separation in the scoreline, it has just been an exciting season overall. It really has been. And, and I think that, you know, like we said, people are watching, they're paying attention and they want to see good games. And if you're going to attract the American fan base, they want to see that kind of stuff. They want to see this this mess of an Eastern conference that could go any which way. And, and when people are trying to pick who's going to win the particular game, it's, it's a toss up because it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be exactly that. It's going to, it's going to be a fight to the finish. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited for what the MLR has produced this season. I'm super jealous of you guys that are going to be part of it because it looks like so much fun every week. <laughs> Although I know that your body's hurting a little bit lately, so maybe it's nice from the outside. You just see me at six in the morning, climb out of bed, Mike. It's not a breeze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's nice from the outside looking here, but, <laughs> but it does look like a lot of fun. And I mean, geez, like it's just so much to look forward to. And now we've seen the mighty giant of Los Angeles fall. Yeah. So the gates are open. You've opened it up for everything now. We could exactly. see no one's invincible we, anymore. We, What's we, gonna we, happen? Uh, win the whole thing on the Western Conference. You know, I mean, this this whole thing could go anywhere from here on out. So this is really exciting, and I and I'm I'm really pumped to be part of it in some small way here. And what are we? Are we halfway through now? Are we are we just over halfway? Uh, I think we're pushing or just about halfway. Yeah, pushing. Uh, a lot of rugby to be played. Uh, still very tight, and you know, like you said, the Giants are just. They've had a little slip at the hill and, you know, it could be tricky to get the footing again if Utah go down there. Well, you know, I don't want to put it out there, but, you know, um, it's going to be interesting. But, um, listen, we're, we're finished up today. Mikey, pleasure talking to you as always. Uh, thanks to our guests for coming on. We're, we're creating quite an alumni of guests now, Mikey, as well. And we've got plenty more coming up throughout the, throughout the season. Um, so, for everyone watching at home, until next week, we'll catch you at the clubhouse. <laughs>